and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one, two, three, four, five good brothers. Ha 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 ha! Back with with a total of six, we have an, we have enough to do our own Sentai team, but we don't do. <laughs> but, but we I don't, call it. It's on green. Yeah, call extra green. ranger. Um, <laughs> well, I think I think we've I think we've already we've already killed that given 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 how I given how I asked for a bunch of common writers when it came to when it came to the art. Um, but we've got we've gone <laughs> no, over no, that. No, no, we could we could go with common writer Gaim. Everyone got their own faction then. <laughs> we already we already have it. We already have a Gaim representative. That's in that's in Doku who is not here because Doku is late. And gay. And gay. <laughs> um, but we have. The, we have the man. Tr the, we have the man whose whose army of whose army of he of he hoeing Jack Frost is currently stuck in uh, is currently stuck in Atlanta traffic. Good brother Akira. We have the we have the we have the man who could pro who could probably punch the shit out of you on his without leaving his horse. Good brother Joel. We have the we have the ha we have the handsome devil of the east or rather the west. Good good brother JT. We oh. have. The ma we have the ma the man taking over your anime under a p under a pair uh, under a pair of hot blooded sunglasses, and we have the we have the man who is my who is my brother in me in mech appreciation this week, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xanatrix. <laughs> this is why I'm the extra ranger because I truly am extra. <laughs> um, <laughs> you forgot to actually say my name. Yes. <laughs> Why did I? Why did I forget? Yeah. Good brother Shade. What? Come on, yeah, man. You, you, you were starting to introduce me, but then you just went right to Zan. You insulted the you insulted the Red Ranger, dude. Come on. Well, uh, that's it. He's off the team. No, no. You know, I'll give you a worse punishment. You get George, pink. George. Oh. We'll, we'll, we'll give him an even worse punishment. We have to send him to. Oh, come on. Who has the Who has the line for it? I'm the alive. Room? I don't know if. I, I am what's, not what's going, going to Detroit. Go. We're sending you to Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> Just be th oh, actually, no, wait, I do have that button. No! No, not Detroit! No! No, please! Anything with that! No. Excellent. I don't, feel like, I don't feel like playing third line goon on the Red Wings. <laughs> <laughs> but so, what are we talking about tonight, Monk? <laughs> The same thing we talk about every night, JT. How to take over the world. Oh, sorry, wrong show. <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> but t tonight, we tonight we tonight. Well, as as the as the say as the saying goes, when a problem comes along, you must whip it. Because this <laughs> week, we are talking about a franchise in chaos. We are talking about Castlevania. Ooh. Vampire Master Fighter. Dracula. Yes. Or the, or at for for the more pedantic or the or the weeaboos among you among you all. Um <laughs> the weebs. It, this is a Now of course this a, something like Castlevania is something that needs no introduction. We have a cl starting with a classic mix of platforming and and gothic horror and Maintaining a whole lot of gothic horror, just w just with other forms of platforming, and a whole lot less bullshit. We'll get into that. <laughs> um, before before we really di before we really dive in deep, I'd be cu I'd be curious what everybody's um, first introduction to ca to Castlevania was. Cause, Ooh, good question. Um, for me, it was um, Bloodlines. During that weird period when Genesis was beginning these ex getting these ex quote unquote exclusives from Konami. Um, what about you, Akira? What was your what was your gateway drug? Surprisingly, and I didn't even notice at the time, but back when I was a kid, the first introduction I had to Castlevania was the GBA game Castlevania Circle of the Moon. Ah, Ooh, nice. that's a good oh. one. Make sure to play with a flashlight because the game's so dark. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, my cousin at, my cousin actually had a Game Boy Advance SP at the time, so I didn't have any issues. Oh, you got Lucky. the backlight. Yep. Lucky bastard. 
not so fortunate. So I so I had to I had to go I had to go out and get some, get one of those clip on lights because but fortunately I was not dumb enough to fall for the false story about the about that about a hidden switch on the back. That was the thing that happened er, that happened early on in the GBA's life life cycle where people thought that the you know that la you know that label on the back if you tear yeah. you tear that off um there's a there's a hole with it with what looks like a button or or something people thought yeah. that that was a that that was a contrast dial that's mm. not what it is in fact don't touch that thing because that is what that is what um regulates power to the LED display so you you mess with that thing you could brick your GBA I know yeah. this because that's what happened to people. People are <laughs> stupid. Derp. Why, why, why would Nintendo put something like that in and then put a warning label in it? You know, some people need to take off their fucking tinfoil hat sometimes. Um. Now, I th as far as far as as far as the whole lighting thing, I think I think it was a consequence of them still using a very similar infrastructure to. Although, be although better refined when it came to LED, when it came to LED tech, um, as opposed as opposed to the LED tech they had they had um, pr they had previously, so the idea of needing a light needing a light hadn't really um, hadn't really crossed their mind up until that point. Because yeah. Of the, even ev because even the um, even the Game Boy Color, well, you had the Game Boy Color had a um, had a had a fairly limited palette, and if you if you look at a lot of the games that were Game Boy Color exclusive, um, a lot of them were a lot of them weren't ex weren't exactly swimming in a whole lot of in a whole lot of color, and and they were using that they were using that color specifically for characters. Um, yeah. So who's ne who's next with Castlevania? Mm -hmm. um, that'd be that'd be Joel. I think. I want to say that the first time I was ever exposed to it, a friend brought me over to play uh, Symphony of the Night on his PlayStation. I think that was my gateway drug. I know after that, I uh, I dusted off the old cop, the old NES copy that my mom had, and played the fuck out of that, even though it was ruthlessly hard. I think that was the first one. And then the first one I owned was uh, Lament of Innocence, which I really liked. Uh, I, I really I got got into the little spinny whip mechanics quite a bit. It, it's Konami, so like their button mashy is is uh, is its choice. So those are those are kind of the the holy trinity for me. I can get that next. Well, next would I think I I think I already went, or did I? You did. You kind of brunch in yours at the beginning, so yeah, you're good. Mm -hmm. Which means JT, you're up next. Uh, I actually found out about the series um through uh remember GameTrailers.com. Yes. Um, oh God, there's a there's a memory for you. Mm -hmm. Well, there's they did. One year they did a retrospective of the entire Castlevania series, and it's I've a, seen that. it is so well made. It is, oh. a, it is it. I watch it once a year every year on Halloween. It's so good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it anyway, that, it. yeah, it, and uh, it, it, it's it's really good. It's really well made. Um, but uh, and that got me interested in the series. After that, I downloaded a Game Boy Game Boy emulator and a ROM of Aria of Sorrow, and I played that through all the way. Loved the heck out of it, and uh, I've been uh, slowly. Uh, and I that was that would be my gateway right there. Mm -hmm. Now, ne now of course next is next is you, good brother Shades. Oh, I'm gonna. A, I'm gonna make you. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna end up being the uh, looking the oldest of the group of you. And I'm about to school all y'all because I get, I got this in two parts. That was first, so the first, the first Castlevania game I played was Dracula's Curse, so I was Ooh. all the way back in the NES days. But Whoa. I can't even go older than that because my first exposure to Castlevania was a very odd one because I used to own a VHS called How to Score More Points in Nintendo Games, made by Kodak. <laughs> it, uh, it was hosted by this guy who claimed he was a world video game champion, though any research on, this op on the guy basically showed he was anything but. He was just a, it was just a thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the tips that this video offered were completely bullshit. I mean, sure, he gave you some legit tips, but a lot of the times it was so half-assed, it you, you couldn't understand a fucking thing if you actually played the damn game. So, especially because 
the game he covered in the franchise was Simon's Curse. Oh. Uh, Simon's Quest? Or Simon's Quest. Thank you. Simon's Quest. It I may as well be called Ooh. Simon's name. Curse. My... As well be called Curse. Yeah, it's a curse. That's why well, I brought it up. Night, Simon's yeah. Quest. Yeah, but yes, regardless, Simon's Quest, the second game. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, that game's already a confusing enough mess on its own. This guy only made it 10 times worse. The videos are actually available. I think the videos are still like, there's actually videos of it on YouTube if you want to see for yourself how bad it is. I get I get the feeling that um that those that those particular videos are prime cringe. Oh, they absolutely are. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say it's as it's as cringe as some of the um as some of the as some of the um that that as the Donkey Kong as the Donkey Kong Country VHS, but it, but it's probably not far off. Um. Yeah. Uh, actually, check the council. Yeah, there. Oh, you, oh, you found. <laughs> just look, <laughs> just looking at, just looking at the cover, is giving me bad vibes. It was, and it was also, it was the, if I remember correctly, it was actually a like baby blue VHS tape. It wasn't a regular black one. That's another red flag. Yeah. <laughs> again, it, in the third red flag, again, it was made by Kodak. You know, the camera people. First item. Apparently, a whole collection of like weird VHS tapes of different things. Uh, it, it, you, they'll see previews for it on the on this one, and oh god, is it bad? The cheese is strong with this one. Cursed Check item. That out later. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's my Who? that's my story. Mm -hmm. Who is next? Mm -hmm. All that's left is Brother Zan. Mm -hmm. Yep. So my exposure is the exposure I got to many different video games all at the same time. When we purchased a Super NES and were given a regular NES, both with a pretty thick stack of games on each uh, when I was four years old. Castlevania 1, Castlevania 2, and Super Castlevania. All three of them. Nice. Not bad, not bad. And I couldn't understand why Simon's Quest was amongst any of them. I'm like, this isn't... Because I played Castlevania 1... Because I really wanted to play Castlevania 1 before playing Super Castlevania because I, I was really excited because I liked everything on the SNES a lot. Um, <laughs> I tried Castlevania 1. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. And then I tried Super Castlevania. I'm like, ooh, eight-way whip. And then I played Castlevania 2. And I was like, why does this have Castlevania's name? <laughs> is it just because this guy's named Simon 2? I didn't understand why they had decided to name it Castlevania 2. I was like, but that doesn't make sense. This is nothing like Castlevania. Drama. I, uh... I was upset, to say the least, about you playing Castlevania 2. It doesn't help that Castlevania 2 is not only a departure from, seri from the normal series gameplay in many ways, but also that its translation is garbage. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Its translation oh, absolutely. Is, is absolute garbage. And, uh, we'll, 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 we'll discuss that more here in a minute, but I definitely agree with you wholeheartedly on that front. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to discuss the details quite yet, but I mean, my, my feelings as a small child for, uh, for that uh, travesty to translation and localization everywhere was to not play that game again until the fan translation on one of the NES emulators came out in, like, 2003. From for, for, four years old to 15 years old. <laughs> let, let me put it to you, to those at home, in, in the simplest terms possible. There is a reason why let's classic YouTuber, the Angry Video Game Nerd, chose Simon's Quest as the topic of his very first video. <laughs> He chose it quite well because that fucking girl. Mm -hmm. But we'll get to that shortly. Yeah. Cursed item. Now, this is a this is a series that has hers. um that has go that has gone that has gone through has gone through many um many inter many interpretations and many t and many takes over the years. A very a very a very experimental uh, series and. I think that I think the ideal place to start with our with our examination is t is tackling 
the um the in, the more in, the more interesting aspects of the NES trilogy. Starting with the original with the original Castlevania, then go, then going with um then going with Simon's Quest and then Dracula's Curse. Um, yeah. Well, if if we're going to tackle the first game and its idea, the the way it was designed, um like many of its contemporaries, Ninja Gaiden and such in around the same era, they were designed both for uh, replayability and time consumption, because it was it was still around that time where uh, n- not everybody knew how to make an engaging home game. A lot of people were still focused on the arcades. Well, and that, that and that and Nintendo was only had a very strict um, limit on f- as far as how many games they'd license. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the point uh, that Zan's trying to make is that because a lot of developers still had an arcade mindset, a lot of the games that came out in the NES era had that arcade level difficulty. But, but even though, when it comes to home consoles, you didn't need it to be that hard. In fact, it was actually detrimental at times to be that difficult. And, well, until you until you got the speedrun streams. It, yeah, until speedrunners became a thing. But th- there's a reason the term Nintendo hard became a thing. Well, yes. yes. But remember <laughs> that, they'll, especially with the first game, the difficulty was an element of its longevity as a game. Like you yes. could, You would hit a wall with your skill, and until you improved, you couldn't advance. And there's not a lot to the first game. It's actually really short if you know how to play it and you're good at it. But like, yeah. until you get to that point, it takes a long time. And so there's a kind of a twofold reward for it. It's it's mm-hmm. extremely hard, but when you get through it, you feel like you've really accomplished something. And two, when you get awesome at it, you get to impress all your friends because they know how fucking hard it is. I love that element of it. I, I never thought that it was a bad element. I, kn- I understood the design philosophy behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, it. It is a very arcade build. It Each level is a very set level. The, the, the layout doesn't change. Enemy spawns are always the same, uh, barring Medusa heads, but we don't talk about that. You can control the Medusa heads, though. You, you, can in, you can influence them when they spawn, but sometimes they spawn a, a little on the up, and sometimes they spawn on the down, and that's where the variance comes in. That's because the devil himself made the Medusa heads. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I disagree. The devil did not make the Medusa heads. The devil made the flea men. Yeah, eh. Oh God! Fleeman, Fleeman. Oh. Fleeman. Uh, fuck y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the 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 point is that the levels are designed straightforward, so that though your movement options and basically your entire way to traverse the stage are a small limited toolkit, that small limited toolkit can do everything. If you have the time and you take and and you you take the time to learn. The pattern of the first floor on the first stage, or whatever, uh, you you can fully through muscle memory and brute force alone get through it without getting hit. Yeah. There are another plenty of people aspect, who do that now. And another aspect of the classic uh, of the original Castlevania that I think was what really stood out was not you know obviously the whip itself was an interesting thing, but the secondary weapons. You know, there were very few of the secondary weapons that were useless. Some were more useful than others, sure. Holy water and the axe here are usually your best bets. Mm-hmm. But the you know, even stuff like the knife and the cross and things like actually the cross is just actually just like, as useful because of certain bosses. But like, yeah, like I said, cross is almost boss. all the Yeah, the cross is boss. No argument there. Like I said, all these other secondary weapons are not just helpful. In a lot of cases, if you master them, they can be essential. Yeah, it's really hard to get past death without doing that holy water spam. Same thing with Dracula. Like that's that's a really easy way to to kind of get over the difficulty curve with those guys. Yeah, there's, uh, there's memes about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there absolutely <laughs> is. Um, when it when it comes to the when it come when it came to when it came to the when it came to the first one, um, like it's, like we said, it was it was a it's a fairly straight it's a fairly straightforward affair. Um, now nowadays I can go, nowadays it's nice to go back on it and see and and play um and play spot the reference <laughs> since, <laughs> since um 
And but then we then we get to Castlevania two, which um like with a lot like with a lot of franchises that had a follow up, this was an attempt at trying to experiment. Although, okay, oh, I'd I'd say try I'd say trying to experiment, but um, I'm not entirely sure if a lot of those experiments from the from the t from the terrible twos um la lasted um lasted all that long or held all that up with age because. Well, we have to ex we have to throw Mario Two out out of the window for this because that wasn't Mario Two, and the actual Mario Two is is nothing but dick moves. <laughs> all all it is is Mario One with even worse fucking precision. Like you, hey, you thought you had to be precise to get through World Eight One through through Eight Four in the first game. No, 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 no. Mario Two, also known as the Lost Levels on the Mario Collection on SNES. Uh, no, f they're all levels that are two giant middle fingers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But anyway, um, get it back to Castlevania. Um, so, back on topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, um, Simon's Quest is it's it, it I think is a, I think is a case of of over ambitious ideas because the the idea the idea of doing essentially an open world with a day, with a day night cycle is. It's certainly an it's certainly an ambitious thing to try this this early on in that era. Yeah. The, pr yeah. the problem is I'm the problem is I think I think it was I think the idea of doing that was a little bit too bleeding edge, which is why you have the annoying thing of all of a sudden stopping and then doing the whole what a horrible night to have a curse. But yeah, the, it had some good ideas, but it was clear they weren't ready to actually pull that off yet. And, but this would end up becoming a precursor to what we would see in later games in the franchise. So mm -hmm. it's definitely an important game, even if it's not a very good game. Yeah, but the the biggest it, the biggest issue is um, Simon's Simon's Quest is an early example of what I like to call hand breaking. And for those for those who haven't heard the the last dozen times that I brought it up, hand breaking is essentially the polar opposite of hand holding, where the solution to a given obstacle, whether it be a boss fight, whether it be a puzzle, whether whether it be just figuring out where the hell you're supposed to go next, is far too obtuse to be able to come to be able to figure it out naturally unless you're using straight up moon logic or you looked it up. There's a. Uh... TV tropes entry about this called Guide Damn It. Yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt, it I think Simon's Quest is the quintessential Guide Damn It game. Mm -hmm. Only because you are not beating that game without a guide. You can't oh. even use in-game hints, especially in the English translation, as Zan brought up earlier, because a lot of the NPCs will outright lie to you. Oh, if you oh. crouch at the cliff, they say something good will happen. The fuck? <laughs> yeah, they'll either tell you absolute bullshit or will flat out lie to you. So you have no idea what the fuck to do until you either get uh, until you either guess the shit out of doing and do every single little thing you could possibly think of, and even that won't work with one particular uh, moment, or you will have to look up a fucking guide. Mm -hmm. Or you do like I did and wait until there was a fan translation that had, you know, good translation with actual hints yeah the the <laughs> rom versions that are in circulation nowadays are infinitely superior <laughs> well infinitely superior with their text let's uh let's not forget that some of the changes to the formula like hearts being a level up system and you losing hearts when you die instead of being reset somewhere that was it was a that just made the game a grind fest in certain mm. situations. Oh yeah. Um, oh yes. The and I think I think it's I think it's quite telling that that whole hearts as levels thing um, began and ended with two. Yeah, especially because of what the hearts were also your currency. Oh, but if you got a game over, you'd lose the ball and have to start all over. And God help you if you were trying to grind to buy a certain item with them and now have to start from the very uh, start at zero again. You're going to throw the controller down and say, fuck that. Especially four-year-old little me. Oh, yeah. yeah four-year-old little me was like, fuck this shit. Oh, yeah, even even a four year old kid can recognize it's there to waste their time. So yeah, this but, this was essentially Conan, and and I think the big thing 
the, the last big thing, and this is me taking a page from when Ego Raptor was good. Uh, uh, yes. I know where you're going oh. to this. The sequelitis point about the color palettes. The color palette of Castlevania 1, due to the limited color structure of the NES, had a lot of oranges and blues. Things that contrasted very well and actually contrasted in an interesting way that didn't make your eyes feel like they wanted to bleed. <laughs> Whereas the uh, the color palettes in in uh, if we look at Simon alone in in Simon's Quest, he's a red and green. Those are contrasting colors, but they are the darkest red and green. And your eyes go, "What am I looking at? Is this a pile of shit? <laughs> a pile of shit with a whip?" I mean, you might and, as well and the background and the that. colors of everything else don't help. In fact, it's very easy to not see a, an, an a projectile coming your way because it will blend in with a background. Yes. <laughs> the color palettes in the first Castlevania game were there to not only to help you see everything, but also to give a bit of visual interest. And they did very well with the limited po uh, colors uh, pan and palette of the NES itself. Everything popped out. You could tell what was what when stuff was coming your way, even if you couldn't react to it in time. Uh, thanks, four-year-old reflexes. Um, <clears throat> but <laughs> the the difficulty at that point was just you had to get good enough by reacting faster. There was there was yeah. no problem doing that with the first game. With the second game, it's I didn't even see that. Where the fuck was that? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, and let's not forget the 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 fake platforms all over the place to the point where you're con you're literally tossing holy water every step just so you don't accidentally fall down to the bottom of a dungeon. And that is now the the other um the other thing the other thing that I, that I that I want that I wanted to I wanted to cover in this because it's um Shades do you have do you have the buy or sell button because I kind of need that now <laughs> I might not have that saved but let me double check you know what give me give me two give me a give me a minute because <laughs> I know I have it saved on my hard drive I just haven't pulled it up on my soundboard. Yeah, because um, there because um, we talk we talked about how the twos in a lot of this era were um were very were very di were very different from their predecessor, very exp very experimental, um with the with the exception of um Mario because like like we said the any the Mario <laughs> two that we got at the time was a lie, still a good game but still a lie. Yeah. Also, oh. I'm ready. All right, hit it. And now it's time to decide what is trash and what is treasure. It's time for buy or sell. So, since this is the first time that I've done this on the on the monastery, where it, whereas I had previously done th done this on um on RVT talks, here's the rules. Buy or sell is me blatantly stealing a a on again off again gimmick from Solo Monster Sounds Off. The approach is you've got two options. You gotta buy one. You gotta sell one. There are no middle grounds. So, this kind of buy or sell is Castlevania II, Simon's Quest, and Zelda II: The Adventure of Link. Uh, Zelda. Ooh. Buy on Zelda II. I sell Castlevania II. Eat shit. <laughs> and allow me to allow me to explain why. Yes, Zelda Two was a very different uh, game in the franchise. Still to considered by some to be the black sheep, the, the early black sheep. We don't count the CDI game, so shut up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, games? Those games don't exist. <laughs> Tell that yeah, GDK they're running one of them this weekend. They're doing what? <laughs> they're, they're doing Link the Faces of Evil this week. GDQ's dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> motherfuckers <laughs> broke the taboo. <laughs> <laughs> they, dead to me. they broke the taboo. Anyway, dead to me. anyway but Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, while it had its problems, hi Death Mountain, how the fuck you doing? <laughs> it it Mountain wasn't overall, that bad. It's right in the name. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying, though. Even with that stuff, like that, and the fact that you, you know, unless if you don't, if you die anywhere before the Great Temple, you get set right back to the very beginning of the game. You know, other than those two little aspects, a lot of Zelda Two was innovative, interesting, and pretty well executed. Mm -hmm. The random encounters weren't that annoying. You know, oftentimes if you were good, you could actually avoid them. 
uh, a lot, you know, the puzzles were still just as into, or it's still interesting. It's just in different ways. Plus, come on, it pulled off GTA before GTA. <laughs> Let's also <laughs> Let's also not forget it. It, it has one of uh, one of the other early uh, video game memes. I am error. Mm. I am error. Which, funny enough, a little fun fact. That actually was not. That was intentional. Mm-hmm. That's why I said the, meme. The mistake was his brother Bagu, because he was supposed to be named Bug. That's a translation error at mm-hmm. that point. That, yeah, that is a translation error. They forgot to translate that properly, but yeah, that was supposed to be. But yeah, and also uh, the, 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 another interesting thing was that a lot of the towns in Zelda Two later became character names in a, in Ocarina of Time. Yep. <laughs> Things you don't know about. Anyway, but yeah, at the end of the day, I will take Zelda 2 over Castlevania 2 any day of the fucking week. Zelda 2's yeah. combat system is actually very well made. That's a that's a big one. Even with And you can be very skilled at the combat system without ever needing the magic. Although the magic is a godsend at many, many different times. Um, and yes, there are some enemy types out there. Hi, Dark Knight. That are... Uh, yeah. that are assholes. They are, without a doubt, some of the hardest things to fight besides Dark Link at the end of the game, which is intended to be as hard as you can be because you're facing yourself. Gotta be if good you enough to che- face yourself. Unless of, course, unless, of course, you cheese it. <laughs> hey, now. Being able to cheap yourself out is still a skill. That's true. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the combat system was always... Basic. It's it's one of the most basic skill based combat systems seen. So yeah. there th- there might be issues with oh my god this is so different than the first Zelda that's why it's bad because that was generally what it was it was yeah, this there was is a so lot of that Re- yeah there was a lot of like yeah. reaction against it at the time but honestly like on a replay I do think it it has merit I'm gonna upset the apple cart though I would sell it I would sell it and I would buy uh, Castlevania too and I will give you the reason. I don't think we'd have almost any of the side-scrolling Castlevanias without Castlevania 2. I think it broke ground in that direction, even though it is itself kind of a shit game. It's shit in an innovative way that Castlevania needed as a franchise, and ultimately that seed grew into some really great games. That's not. It is a fair point. Like I said earlier, it was basic. You could, you could tell that Iga make, drew inspiration from it when he made his versions of Castlevania later on. Though He, he drew I would more inspiration argue- from Metroid. Well, I grant you that, but I'm just saying, I'm, I'm willing to bet he at least looked at Castlevania 2 at some point. My point being, though, also, uh, the argument can be made that, that Zelda 2 did the exact same thing for its franchise, because a lot of its elements would be later utilized in a lot of the 3D Zelda games. Yep. I feel like what I love Zelda for came out of the first game, though. Like, they've even done that with Breath of the Wild. They really went back to the, the first game template, and that's what I always love Zelda for. But everything I love Castlevania for that isn't the first game came out of the second game. I think it really just it paid more dividends overall. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's a case. It's a case of six and one half dozen of the other, really. Yeah, yeah. This is the justification for my buy sell. That's what. That's why. I, that's why I wanted to use that in particular for for buy or sell because the whole point of buy or sell is is presenting is presenting you with a no win situation. <laughs> <laughs> um. And uh, and I'm not le- and some people have tried to see if they can Captain Kirk their way their way out of this. Um, but I, but I am far too savvy for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bottom line, if we're not arguing over the picks, obviously something obviously it didn't work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think I th- much. I think um I think Castlevania three Dracu- Dracula's Curse. Aside aside from the fact that I feel like I feel like this is this is the much like how before I went before we went live I said that Dragon Quest three is the first true Dragon Quest I feel like I feel like Dracula's Curse is the first in, is the first um case where okay now we've done our experimenting now we actually have a direction that we're going to be following now we've got now we've got a we we're not just slap dashing things together now we actually know what we're doing yeah a lot of the elements of Castlevania three really came to its own you know mm-hmm. obviously the difficulty is still just as hard in fact it's consider it's probably one of the most difficult of the three of the trilogy but the difficulty always felt 
you know, legit. It was a case of, like, like it was a, more so than even Castlevania 1. It was a case of, if you fucked up, it's your fault, not mm -hmm. the games. And they added an extra element with the changeable allies, you know. You, and, and you can pick which allies would work good for you. You can pick, you know, the spell Or you can pick no casting. ally. Mm -hmm. Or you can pick no ally at all if you, really, if you want to go for a little challenge. But you've got the magic casting Saifa Belnades. Who is definitely who? You know, has some good spells. That free spell can be a godsend. Mm -hmm. You've got free Grant Dynast. No. Hmm? Love the free spell. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you've got Grant Dynasty, who's you know the thief who can climb on walls and ceilings, making him very good to get around certain areas that you don't. And have he to was deal the with. only character who could change direction in the middle of his jump. Yes, so he had a lot going from there. And then you've got Alucard, who combat-wise was pretty weak, but his flight ability can help you skip a lot of difficult areas. So yeah. you I had mean, some choice in what you wanted to do. It, but he could shoot Dracula fireballs. When you say combat-wise, he was pretty weak. The, the fireballs were uh, were not. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair, you're, you're fair point, but I'm saying compared to the other, th the other three th uh, players, eh, he doesn't hold up as well. But he has his own benefits that make him just as valuable. Mm -hmm. Yes. And... When I when I see when I see a lot of people um, doing their doing their own throwbacks to to um oh, to to eight bit style um eight bit style Castlevania, um, Dracula's Curse seems to be the one that they draw the most from, and I think I think that's te I think that's telling when it comes to it when it comes to its um, longevity. Also, I will I will admit that I can I cannot I cannot un I cannot unhear um. I cannot unhear the ent this entire trilogy without th without thinking of the adventures of Dwayne and Brando. Uh, oh yeah, uh, uh, that group uh, such a rocky history of them, but my god, did they make some damn good tracks? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that bring that that brings us to the to the SNES era, and um. Or ra rather, the, rather the sixteen-bit era, and this is this is where we get something um, very interesting that Kon that Konami had done. I'm not sh I'm not sure if I can't think of any other company that really did this. Now this was smack dab in the middle of the sixteen-bit console wars. Everybody know everybody knows the pissing match, the whole Genesis does what Nintendo don't, all all that kind of stuff. But Konami did some Konami did something interesting. Where they would they would put in certain games exclusively for the Genesis that would play slightly different to the SNES counterpart. For example, um, the SNES got Turtles in Time, whereas the whereas the Genesis got Hyperstone Heist. Um, in in the Contra series, you had Contra Three: The Alien Wars for the for the SNES, and you had Contra Hardcore for the Ge for the Genesis. And in the case of Castlevania, we have the whole thing with Super Castlevania 4 and Castlevania Bloodlines. Also known as Vampire Killer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's interesting how different... Though this was a case where it was a radical departure because the two games could not be more different compa yeah. uh, by comparison. Because, yeah, Super Castlevania 4 was simply a remake, story-wise, of the original Castlevania, but yeah. with some damn new mechanics... The biggest one being, of course, the fact that you could actually control the whip in all eight directions and spin it around. Mm -hmm. big, which, cha big change right there. Big change, though, some have argued, and we go back to Eager Raptor for this, the fact that it actually hurt the overall gameplay because the whip was OP as hell. For real. No it, denying that. You didn't even need the side weapons because the whip could handle just about any situation. Which then you I get to the Genesis. Only if you got that good with it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the whip, the whip, the whip was only OP in the hands of those who took the time to make it OP. That's one of the many different issues I had with Ego Raptor's sequelitis assessment of of the Super Dracula Four Whip. No, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not saying his argument was was infallible, but it's definitely a reference point. And but I think the point is is the fact that even an expert player in the original trilogy. Or at least the original two pem the two games in the trilogy one and three, had to still use side weapons because they were essential. Whereas in Castlevania Four, if you were good enough, you did not need side weapons at all. Although, when 
and when you when you now with the other um with the other entries that I mentioned with that whole with that whole SNES Genesis thing, the only other the only other game that I can that I can think of around this time that was that was such a radical departure from from the um from from its from its SNES counterpart had to do with the two sequels to Rocket Knight Adventures. Where you yeah, had... I'd argue that because really the the SNES version of Sparkster was literally just the first game. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. that's all it really was. It was a slightly tweaked remake of the original. Mm -hmm. So I'd argue that, but I see where you're coming from there. But yeah, you know, speaking of, let's get to the Genesis game Bloodline. Bloodline again... is radically different from. Oh from yeah, from Super Castlevania. I'd say there's there's some slight differences between the between the pairs that we've talked about. This is the, this is the this is the case where it's al it's almost night and day. Yeah, and it's because Sorry. this one's more of an action adventure game than it is just a uh an action game. Yeah, it still contained most. It was mostly a side scrolling experience like the others, but. It's had some differences in terms of its presentation and its setup. It was a different story because this one was kind of set in a more real world setting as opposed to the cast of the originals, which were so fantastical they couldn't have they couldn't be real. And you have, you know, the their character the main characters were based on the original uh Van Helsing legend. Mm -hmm. You know, you had John Morris, the son of Quincy Morris, you know, they being really deep into the original Dracula lore, and then you've got Eric Lacard, my boy. Yeah, and that's the there's another big difference. You got two pl ma playable main characters with very different styles. John Morris obviously was the equivalent was the Belmont of the team because he can use the whip and things like that. Whereas Eric Lacard, he actually he had a good he was a he was more of a dragoon in a sense. Mm -hmm. He had a lance. He had a lance, and he could he could have some special jumping. Uh, skills, so th I think Congo Dragoon would be a perfect fit. All I can think of when we say John Morris is Jonathan Charlotte, Jonathan Charlotte, Jonathan Charlotte. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll, we'll get, get to that, that eventually. Point. Yeah, I know. I just I, that's the only thing I hear when I hear John Morris because I know that his son is. <laughs> can't football. blame you. Can't blame you. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, plus you had other stuff like you know the the power ups, uh, especially you know you, you had the side weapons, but also the crystals. I mean. If you get enough power ups for the for the main weapon, especially for uh, uh, John, you get like you get a, 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 a fireball basically that you can launch from your whip, and when that goes off, you actually get to hear Vampire Killer. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Although, tr although truth truth be to truth be told, um, I'd say the I think I think what I f what I find kind of interesting is when I look when I look at um Bloodlines, um. The it was it was initial it was initially promoted as a as a completely original vamp vampire action game, yeah. And to the point where in Japan it was called Vampire Killer, but as time went on, <laughs> um, it was it was it it would it would later be called in Japan Castlevania Gaiden as as that was printed on the um the the um. The Dracula X Chino Rondo um, strategy guide, and 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 then it and then um, in Europe it was called Castlevania: The New Generation. So you add even more confusion. <laughs> yeah, this this game caused a lot of trouble when it came to that kind of thing. Oh, and truth be truth be told, it is it is best it is best served as a as a kind of as a kind of side story, and I don't I don't even think it's I don't even consider think its events are considered canon they are only they are. For the fact that uh in portrait of ruin john's son jonathan is involved and uh, eric lacard has become a spirit known as wind hmm. yeah that that yeah portrait of ruin kind of brought bloodlines yep. into the canon so yeah it's it's considered a main entry yeah i forgot yep. i forgot about that i forgot about that um but I mean, that... They turned Eric Lacard into a Shota in Judgment. I forgot about that. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting into that later. But ooh, I got some shit to say. But when it, but um, now when it, now beyond beyond that, although we 
we technically have a trilogy ar around this time, but not quite, because shortly after this was um, was Dracula X, i.e. the um, the SNES port of Rondo of Blood, because Rondo of Blood was exclusively on on um, Kon on Konami's PC Engine um, consoles, which they which they were still doing at the time. Um, in fact, the a, another another case of where where a Konami legacy character has has history with with these PC engines is the original Metal Gear, which yeah is in which much like much like how the original Metal Gear on the MSX is superior to the NES version, um, Rondo of Blood is super is superior to um, Dracula X and Dracula X. I want I want to make clear that it's not a bad game. And it's certainly a hard game, but as um as Lord Cat had put up when he did a Until We Win years ago, it is hard without the polish. It's v large, and I'd say large. I'd say a large amount of this is the fact that this was around the time when in Japan the king the king was the PC ninety eight um system. And, PC engine. Mm hmm. And Rondo of Blood was built on was built on that framework, which was significantly more powerful than consoles. And and it was while well, in the West it was kind of downplayed and pretty much ignored. In Japan, the PC Engine was really popular. Like it was a direct competitor to both Sega and Nintendo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. For the for the longest for the longest time, Rondo of Blood was that was was that uh, was equivalent to a lost episode, i.e. the gr the greatest game we never got a chance to play, up until the up until the the tw the twenty first century when we got the Dracula X Chronicles on PSP. Or, you know, when uh when you have a PC Engine emulator, but we don't talk about that, right? <laughs> yeah, we're talking legitimately here. Well, there's a, well, there's also there's also the fact that as as we got better and better tech, it, be, it became trickier and trickier to translate because you've got more stuff that you need to handle. Um. Yeah. Wh which does which makes things which makes things a bit confusing. The reason the reason why I'm I'm only briefly covering um, Rondo of Blood in, in this regard is there's is. There's not there's not a whole there's not a whole lot to say. I mean we do we do have um this is where we do have we do have Rick we do have Richter and Maria so they so they kept the idea of of two of two central protagonists. Yep. And um, and, and and they had a, some interesting things with it like searching for the other three the other three maidens alongside finding Maria with Annette, Tara and Iris. Mhm. Mm but and of course, it was also the first to use anime style cutscenes. Uh, it was the only time it really ever used that, but the portraits and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, this was the beginning of a new storyline for Castlevania, which yep. would later follow up with another game that we'll be getting to in the next era. Yeah. Now, this is this is where this is where we get into the into the turning point. And as I understand it. While while this era and 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 the, and um what it, and what it did would be would be the defining fact would be the defining factor for for designs for generations to come. It was not a very easy thing. In fact, if I recall, it was a ridiculously hard sell because because this was right in the middle of the arms of the three D arms race that was going on at the time. Yeah, this this was during the era where every franchise felt they had to make the jump to 3D because, well, Nintendo proved it could be done. Mm -hmm. So everyone's like, you gotta get in on that shit. And but th but then we but there's a new pl but there was another person who came into Konami that balked at the idea, a man by the name of Koji Igarashi. Iga. Better, better known at better known as Iga, and it. This is also this is also where where we started where we started getting the term search action, or as it's also known, Metroidvania. Um, combination of the Metroid games that had come on NES and SNES, 
along with the new design philosophy for Symphony of the Night. Um, although one one for, there's a there's there's a couple there's a couple of things that I with when it comes to it that I kind that I kind of consider very bold moves. The first of which is the fact that our protagonist is not a Belmont. We have no Belmont association, which we've ha which we've had as a as a given up until this point. The second is making a sequel to, because Symphony of the Night is technically a sequel to Rondo of Blood. It is. That's and why you start with a series. That's why you start with a, a fight between Richter and Dracula. Mm -hmm. They they literally start Symphony of the Night with the final battle from Rondo of Blood. Slightly tweaked, but it's that's what it is. Yeah. And also, the best line ever. What is a man? Smashes glass to the ground. A miserable pile of secrets! <laughs> no, I'm not talking! How about that, you? I want that quote on my headstone. I love <laughs> right. it so much. <laughs> I'm sure you're not the only one, Joel. I'm sure you're uh, not the only one. And of, co of course, um, if anybody remembers Press Start Adventures, they made fun of this particular scene with the, uh, with the whole, Die, monster! We don't belong in your world! But we're willing to justify <laughs> killing you and taking your crystals! Yeah, that that's the thing. The, it, the, the voice acting in Symphony of the Night was a level of cheese that just could not be denied. But I never thought I never that. I never thought it was that bad. I thought it. I no, thought no, no, it, it, no, it's not bad. It it's just cheese. There's it's very. Just, it was just they chewed the scenery. Yeah, it's yeah. Of, it's of its time. And, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, the reason for this is Symphony of the Night is a very early game to have voice acting on. It's a PlayStation 1 game. Mm -hmm. um, voice acting was not very common even back then, except for in some really bigger budget games. Metal Gear Solid is a big one to think of there. Um, and Resident Evil. Resident mm. Evil. <laughs> for better or worse. You were almost a Jill sandwich! That's yeah, pretty hammy yeah. for its time, too. Whereas, <laughs> whereas Metal Gear Solid was very, very... Very like they didn't really chew the scenery as much in comparison. No, they played it relatively straight, and it worked out well for them. Even though there was a slight hint of cheese, it wasn't near as cheesy as other game as the other games we mentioned here. But yeah, yeah like when you li listen to Scott McCulloch voicing Richter in that scene, and uh, and everything else that was going on, you know, like let's see, let me. I'm trying to actually, I'm actually looking up the voice cast right now. I could, the one name I know for for a fact was Robert Belgrade, who played Alucard. Mm -hmm. Legend. Robert Belgrade is such a good guy, and he did come back for uh, another game. Yep, he, yep, he did. We'll and uh, it was we'll Michael G who uh, Michael G who played uh, Dracula in Symphony of the Night. I I like, would he, I will also note that Be that Belgrade was was what was perfectly willing to make to make fun to make fun of his big break when he when he showed up as a recurring character in um, Press Start Adventures. Yeah. By the way, I'll be right back. All right. But like the the entire the entire and I can I'm pretty sure I can imitate this pretty well without even listening to the video. The entire exchange. Die monster, you don't belong in this world. It was not by my hand I was once again given flesh. I was brought here by humans who wished to pay me tribute. <laughs> tribute? You steal men's souls and make them your slaves. Perhaps the same could be said of all religions. Your words are as empty as your soul. Mankind ill needs a savior such as you. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk! That's you! It, the, the ham is there. You can yeah. taste that ham. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh. I think the only way we could get more hammy is is if we hired Brian Blessed, but um, that's um, go that's going a little bit too far. And then you'd have then you'd have a fantastic English accent in all of that as well. Yeah, but the the problem is um, br <laughs> the problem is have you have you ever seen have you ever seen um Bri Brian Blessed whenever he whenever he's not on script. <laughs> <laughs> yes, monk I have. I love him, but he's but he's um nuts. <laughs> I mean, he that makes him a perfect Dracula then, right? <laughs> he's certainly he's certainly the perfect drinking buddy, I'll put it that way. <laughs> um I keep 
Yeah, but, very good. Very good, Alucard and Symphony. I keep track of anybody with a deeper voice than mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> this this does all of this does lead into the fact that Rondo of Blood's ending comes into the beginning of Symphony of the Night, mm-hmm. and Symphony of the Night was a drastic shift. Um, as we said, it was it was very bold in making the decisions that it made. We had the voice it, acting. It, it stayed 2D in during the 3D revolution. Mm-hmm. That's one. But then it also did something even bigger. It took Castlevania, which was fairly formulaic. Even with uh, the slightly open worldiness of 2, 1 and 3, you had stage designs. They were It was a, sta- a linear, pretty linear stage. There were some vertical elements to it, but you would still follow these stages to the end. And then in Castlevania 3, you'd make your choice on which ending for the stage you're taking to get to the next stage, which was nice. You know, this was... You could tell from the map design alone that this had taken um, le- a, a ton of leaves for its map design out of Metroid, probably specifically Super Metroid. Mm-hmm. A large, expansive, non-linear uh, experience. One that you could actually technically end early. Except, would you call it ending early when all of the second half is hidden behind a choice you didn't know you had to make and, and stuff you didn't know you had to do? Mm-hmm. This was... I actually love that aspect of it, by the way. I love how hidden that is. I, oh, um, as someone who, who's a completionist, I, since I did everything I absolutely could before doing what I thought was the final boss, when, uh, when the upside down castle appeared i was like there's another half of the game here what it is impressive that they managed to cram that cram that much content on, onto onto that disc um although although um years later i ended up playing the saturn port and it's cl- it's clear which one was the superior version <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned I mean, the saturn that what i, I was mean, saying i mean <laughs> Well, you mentioned the Saturn. As much as we love Sagata Sanjiro, um, he was rooting for the wrong platform. Well, the big, the big thing when it came to the set, when it came to the Saturn, I only found out about this because it was brought up on a video from um, Video Game Esoterica, who was mm-hmm. who was really damn cool. Um, Sega did not have a whole lot of faith in 3D. They 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 saw it they saw it as as just a um as just a as just a as a as a um fad they did not they did not think that 3D would become a standard and they were going to go with sprites for another generation and then when that turned out to be not the case they ended up scrambling the big the big problem was and the, is uh, the big and the big reason why the Saturn was so hard to program for for a lot for a lot of de- for a lot of developers is is because of the way the hardware was set up. With um, with some with the PlayStation, it was fairly straightforward: one CPU, one GPU. With the with the set with the Saturn, you had four CPUs that you had to account for, and one G and one GPU. And mm-hmm. that and that meant that meant that a lot of designers were spinning plates. And granted. There were plenty of. That's not to. That's not to say it was impossible to do. It was just. It was just more difficult because you had to be spinning four plates at once. And because of that, if you look at these Saturn ports for things like Castlevania or um or Grandia or or the like, there was a lot of there was a lot of um. A lot of stuff missing. There are entire sections in Symphony of the Night that were cu- that had to be cut. Yeah, and it's still amazing mm-hmm. how good uh, the game actually ends up being. Even even to the the, the point that uh, it technically had four endings. Yeah, four separate c- conclusions you could come to. Especially as I said, if you don't do the stuff you have to do to determine, oh, Richter isn't a bad guy after all. Mm-hmm. You, 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 you kind of kill Richter Belmont. Yeah, yeah. W- oops. Oops. <laughs> I didn't I, mean to do that, I swear. 
I I have not played Symphony of the Night. I have tried, but I cannot get an, uh, a PlayStation emulator to work on my PC. However, they recently announced at the last E3 that there will be a physical release of Symphony of the Night and Rondo of Blood together. Uh, they I think they I think it was Castlevania Chronicles or something. It, it was released on the PlayStation Store, but uh, now they're actually releasing it as an actual physical disc release, and I am. All and I am totally on top of that, so I'm yeah, looking forward to that. Time, yikes! That took them a while to jump on that bandwagon. Mm-hmm. But uh, well, and the the big thing with uh with so the other big departure with Symphony of the Night, uh, besides the whole you've gone from pretty linear gameplay to really open ended gameplay loop, is it's an RPG. You've got it some is. pretty classic RPG elements to it. You've got the st- the different statistics you've got the level ups from experience you've got an equipment system you've got an item system there's a lot of different things within it that it went from being an action adventure game to an action adventure rpg it's still got the action it's still got the adventure they're both there though they're both there in spades let's let's be perfectly honest here mm-hmm. but then you've got that heavy RPG aspect, and the story got flushed out. I mean, there's a bunch of sequences in in Symphony of the Night that are very touching, um, especially stuff having to do with the difference upon uh, how Alucard views his mother's death versus how his father Dracula views, well, Dracula's Mm -hmm. wife's death. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, And this, this, uh, this also introduced... The now famous or infamous Backdash. Um, mm-hmm. Remember that Backdash is always faster, guys. <laughs> All right, I'm back. Welcome, Welcome I've, back, Shades. Um, I've seen plenty of Let's Plays where it is nothing but Backdash, and that shit gets annoying I, real fast. <laughs> well, I assume we're still talking <laughs> Symphony. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. It, watch. I would suggest you watch a TAS where they Backdash, but they're moving forward. It is the most hilarious shit to see ever. <laughs> the reason why TAS is so entertaining sometimes. Where Absolutely. they just do this vibrating backdash that is just the weirdest thing. Yeah. But yeah, when it comes to speedruns or most Let's Plays, they're going to backdash all the time because it is faster. It's just that much better. There are other games where the backdash was not given quite as an abusable frame loop as the backdash in symphony of the night where it's more useful to use it as an uh, as the combat skill it's meant to be rather than as a transport method mm-hmm. but yeah <laughs> let's be fair here symphony and i being the first of its kind it had some it had some kinks to work out there were a lot of op maneuvers and abilities you know you had the bat in its dash the wolf the wolf form in its dash and uh, oh yeah uh Anyone up? Anyone uh, down for holding the chrysogram? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you uh, get the weapon, you have won. Mm-hmm. I don't care how bad you are at the game. You get the chrysogram, you win. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah! Ah, uh, the chrysogram. For anyone who's not aware of what the chrysogram is, why not give them the down low there, shades? So it is a very rare weapon that you can find in, uh, I think it was the tower, not the clock mm-hmm. tower, but the other tower. Yeah. And it, it, it uh, it's a very rare drop, but when you get it, it is a sword that is already powerful enough its own, but it also, like, rapid, like each swing counts as, like, six or seven uh, rapid-fire slashes, guaranteed to put down most enemies in a single uh, hit. You go full Strider. Let's, let's, not, let's drop yeah, the bullshit. You go full Strider. <laughs> That's it's one of the it. it's one of the few weapons. So here's here's a bigger here's a bigger explanation. It's one of the few weapons that can be swung while moving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it to 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 say it is OP is an understatement. And it's it's a four it's a four times per per button press. Um, okay, so and it, close, but still. and it covers everything in front of Alucard, uh, from higher than his head to as low as his feet. So, yeah, anything that is in front of you is dead. And then you can equip one to each attack, each uh, each hand, meaning you can equip one to each attack button. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just 
hammer between the two so that the re the reset of one is cooling down while you're hitting the other. Yeah. <laughs> Crystal grooms are kind of broken in Symphony. Which is pro which is probably why that ended up becoming his pri Elucard's primary weapon in um in Lo in the DLC for Lords of Shadow Two. But that's something that's something we'll get to that's something we'll get to later. I feel like that's a in universe acknowledgement of how broken that weapon is. Yeah. But I mean, um, when you it, when you it, mentioned it, when you mentioned that they had some kinks to iron out, there were two things that came to mind. One is how there were some there were some sub weapons that were fairly useful, so, and some that were significantly less so. The the um the ultimate case of uselessness for me was the salt. Oh God, yeah, the salt was a. What the fuck is the point of even adding that thing? It, what the. F yeah, you, you have to it go. It fires in a, in a very slight arc, though it's not really. It has a very short range, and it doesn't do all that much damage. It's basically Ball a put it in there to troll everybody. It's basically a gimped version. I get the I get the idea of it. You know the whole the whole salt whole, purifies. Yeah, salt purifies. Sp spread it spread it around. It's the re it's the reason why. Re unfortunately, salt is not good enough for Reagan because he didn't get purified salt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had, I had to go. I had to go there, but the um, even as a kid, I always looked at that thing and asked, "It's trying. It's trying to do the whole area denial thing. Why would I pick this when I can do this exact same thing better with holy water?" Well, actually, monk, I have an answer for you. Down here, salt is a way of life. <laughs> I was I was going to say if if we had to ask fellow brother Ball were he here it'd be this quote exactly. You breathe that in and you can constantly taste the salt. No, I I would say that, but uh, let's not forget that let's not forget that brother Ball made a salt mining hopper progress key. Uh, <sighs> that man has issues, I swear, and I should know. I know the man re uh, IRL. But. The, but that be that being said, the um the little the little gem, I can um if it had if it had more damage, I could see it being potentially useful in in more confined areas. Um, oh yeah. Since uh, it's es it's essentially it's essentially a um it's essentially pong. <laughs> um, yeah. But I'd say I'd say if there's one I say if there's one thing that. I'm not going to say it's completely useless, but cer but its usefulness is certainly is certainly gimped by several factors. It would have to be the spells, because for one, for the most part, yeah. For one, um, I'm not entirely sure if using fighting game type commands for spell use was a good idea. And um, I can understand why they did it though. Yeah, the because um. The control set the control setup was already was already pretty full as it is, so I'm not so I'm not I'm not giving them too I'm not giving them too much shit for that factor. Yeah, it's just that most of the spells were kind of useless. Like there was the one, the the one blood spell that's only really good for those super bleeding zombies. Yeah, dark metamorphosis. Otherwise, yeah, the dark metamorphosis is unless you're fighting those bloody zombies, there it's a useless spell. The only spell really that was of any value was Soul Steel. Soul Steel. Because that's like, especially if you, you get in a room with a lot of enemies, that is basically a full hit, a full heal right there. Yeah. So, so I have a, I have a question for you, Monk. You said salt, right? Mm-hmm. Are, are you sure you're not talking about the, uh, the Vibuti? I just, I just call, I just called it that as, as a joke. I know it's supposed to be ashes from a saint. Yeah, it's it's saints' ashes. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, but the way he tosses it, the way it looks, it's it looks like fucking salt. Let's call mm -hmm. it what it is. Yeah. Although, did you guys ever, when you were playing Richter in the beginning, if you managed to pick it up, did you ever try the item graph with it? <laughs> I I never did. Oh. You can only get the item crash on the Saturn version anyway, but <laughs> still, yeah. it's, it's fucking. It's, it's, I draw a storm. Um, I we, do. We, we. <laughs> I I do rem I do remember in now um, 
Of course, of course, of course, there are, of course, there are some several of the mainstays when it comes when it came to sub weapons were still were still were still plenty useful. Um, chief, chief, um, chief among them being things like the axe and the cross. The and cross, especially much. given how many big boys you've you've got you've got in you've got in fights. Yeah, there there were some times where that's useful, but. The, the only issue is, is that once again, much like Castlevania 4, your main weapons, especially if you get the right ones, and not even just talking the Chrysogram, that you don't really need it. And there was another OP uh, weapon we forgot to bring up. Well, to call it a weapon would be kind of a misnomer. The Alucard Shield. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> if you combine that with that, was the it was the shield, the shield, uh, a certain staff. Mm-hmm. That basically activated se uh, special functions depending on what shield you carried. You can you paired that up with the Alucard shield. Uh, yeah, you, you're invincible. <laughs> and because, like I like I said, I when when you're when you're trying a new idea like this kind of thing, you have a lot of throw shit against the wall and see what sticks. And that's and that's an un that's an unfortunate consequence of of this kind of thing. Um, you look at a to you to use uh, to use a uh, to use another RPG example. Consider the glut of cla consider the glut of jobs that are in Final Fantasy three that never lasted beyond Final Fantasy three, or got integrated into other jobs. Yeah. Um. Or or um or how um how. Everybody, everybody talks up a storm about about DBZ Budokai Three, but everybody, f because of its roster, because of all of it, because its massive roster, but everybody forgets that about two thirds of that roster are, cl are have clone move sets. <laughs> hmm. uh, and it's the um, it's the shield rod or the Moblung sword you're thinking of. Yeah, the shield rod. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dan. But the the reason the Alucard shield is more broken than the Chrysogrim is because the Christogram is a percentage drop from an enemy called the Shmoo. Mm -hmm. The Alucard Shield and the Shield Rod are guaranteed drops. They're fixed, and they're easily found. And the Alucard Shield, when used as an attack shield, has a base 255 hit damage multiple times per second when in contact with an enemy, and the shield also recovers... 8 HP, 1 heart, and 3 seconds of invincibility per activation, essentially. Yeah. Now, I have... Now, um, since I talked about the whole hand-breaking thing, I, I want to make clear that I do not consider the... I do not consider the ways to get the best ending in, um... in the... in, in um, Symphony of the Night to be, um, hand-breaking, simply because you're, you're going to... you're going to inevitably get the... Find out, find these kind of things out just by just by exploring. Yeah, and they do give you subtle hints here and there about things. So if you're paying attention, it will tell you how to get that ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I like I said, I was someone who had who knew that who only knew when I very first played Symphony of the Night that Richter was at the top of the castle and I was going to have to face him there. And so I was someone who, being the completionist that I was even back then, was like. I want to see what everything else is. And, you know, you get the little hints. You find out stuff about Shaft. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you're like, huh, maybe I can get out of this without killing Richter. And you go in, and you defeat Shaft instead. And at that point, I was like, oh, cool, good end. And then, boom, like, like I said last time, the yeah. entire upside-down castle. Yeah, well, to be f uh, also Zane, you, you neglected to mention that. Yeah, you find out the hints, but what you're supposed to do is you grab the two, the gold and silver rings, mm -hmm. and that will take you to an underground thing. Where in the PlayStation version, you just run into Maria Men Renard from Rondo of Blood, and she gives you the sunglasses that help you see Shaft's little orb. Mm -hmm. However, if you're playing the Saturn version, well, uh, you got to do a little, a little something extra in order to get it. <laughs> Yeah, you have to fight Mar fight Maria, and uh, she ain't no fucking pushover. Boy, no, she ain't. <laughs> she will throw you through a fucking wall if you're not prepared. Which, to be to be fair, get to be fair, given the fact that she ma that um 
that if you if you sucked at if you sucked in the in the in the in the opening thing with Richter, she would end up bailing you out and making you invincible for the rest of the fight. <laughs> um, that and sh that and sh all all of her magic all of her magical abilities are are ba are based on the f are based on the four great houses of the of the of of Chinese astrology. Yep. Um. And when it com when it comes to when it, when it comes to the when it came when it came to Shaft, I will I will admit even even as a kid, I knew I knew I knew about the I knew about the great the the greatest the one of the greatest theme songs ever. So yes, I was making the dumb jokes even then. Some people were <laughs> some people were making some people were making dick some people were making dick jokes ab about ha about that kind of name. I was not making dick jokes because that's too easy. I was I was making I, jokes about him being a bad mother. Shut your mouth. <laughs> oh, we're just talking about Shaft. We can dig it. Yeah, yeah, we can. Dig it. <laughs> <laughs> but Symphony of the Night is uh, essentially, the, as we said, the turning point where we got this expansive look. Like this, this was where the the story really started to expand and take off mm -hmm. yeah we, we started uh, to learn uh, more about dracula's past with his with his lover the you know alucard's mother mm -hmm. we learn more about how the castle operates this castle is a creature of chaos it may take many incarnations clever move there konami mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it hinted at the balance of chaos versus order in the castlevania universe that, yeah, you know, the whole idea that the, the, you know, as long as the hearts of man bar, bar negativity, there will always be a Castlevania. There will always be a Dracula, but there will also always be someone to stand up and stop him. Mm -hmm. The fight will never truly end. Until they went pachinko and mobile phones. We're not uh, talking about that. We're not talking about that. <laughs> those, those can get fired out of a cannon in a stun. Hey, hey, Monk, could we say that the mobile games and the, and the pachinko games are headcanon for Konami? <laughs> Do because I... we all know your rule. We head... all know your rule. Head cannons get the fucking head cannon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that be now that uh, being that being said, I um, I will I will I will free I will. Free, when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to um Symphony of the Night, um, I will can I, I will I can will I, can I say something? Go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I just want to say Symphony of the Night, great game, but for the at least for the PlayStation, horrible cover art. Eh, wasn't great, but I've, wasn't we've it, seen far worse. Wasn't great. I I ch I chalked this up to this was this was still during that period where. Where the U.S. branches of a lot of of a lot of companies felt that they had to do di they had to do different art because this is because Symphony of the Night is far from the only offender and I get the I get the feeling I know why you're saying that because Symphony of, Symphony of the Night if I'm not mistaken was the first case of of Ca of Castlevania working with Ayami Kojima whose visual style has basically defined Castlevania ever since. Hi hey, hi. Hey. Ayami Kojima is the designer, um, and yes, Symphony of the Night was the first Castlevania she worked on. Yeah, and, and, and right away you can see the very clear difference. Unfortunately, like you said, the American box art is very different than the Japanese. When you, when you look at the Japanese and even the European box art, mm -hmm. you got this nice visage of Alucard holding a sword, standing there amongst the cast uh, with the castle in the background. You know, candles in front looks really badass. It's a, it's very, it's, it's. I, I described it as what I described it as what would happen if Drew Struzan lived in the Victorian age. Yeah, I could definitely see that. But then you get to the American box art, and it's just simply a the castle in a silhouette behind a stormy cloud with the moon in the sky. That's literally it. And I, th it I tells think, me, I think the cover art that was used for for um for the. For the um, enhanced port of the original, called called um, it wasn't. I think it wasn't. It wasn't called Bloodlines. It was called something else on the PS One. And the fact that that used Ayami Kojima's art, I think, shows that they became very aware of their mistake. 
Chronicles. You're thinking Chronicles. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Which was the enhanced port of uh, of the original Castlevania on PS1. Yeah. So, sorry to cu- sorry to cut you off on that, JT. No, that's fine. I said my I said my piece. You, uh, you, you guys, we we pretty much laid it out. Continue. Um. <laughs> yeah. Now, now I'm not gonna co- I'm not going to cover Chronicles in this. That was that was really the only mention that I wanted to make of it because. It's just an enhanced port of of the of the original with a few with a few extra tweaks here and there. There's not a whole yeah. lot, there's not a whole lot to really cover. Um, but that doesn't it's mean Simon. Yeah. It's Simon fighting Dracula again. But I do I do recall or I do recall in the early 2000s there was a brief attempt at doing a Castlevania um, comic book. I on, I cannot for the life of me remember the full title of it, but I do remember reading it. At least the first four issues of it. Um, I don't know how long it lasted after that, and I haven't been able to. I have not been able to find scans of that comic. I'm sure they're. I'm sure they're out there. I just haven't been able to find it. And I know. I I'm, think I found what you're looking for because I just checked. I'm. I, I'm on the Castlevania wiki right now. Mm-hmm. And they have a section for comics and manga. Does the name Castlevania the Belmont Legacy ring any bells? Yes. There you go. Yeah, that was that was the, and um, it cer- it um it was certain. I'm not gonna say it was great. It was certainly in it. It was cert- I've certainly seen worse video game to com, um, video game to comic adaptations. Hi, hi, Doom. How you doing? <laughs> uh, hey, no, no, no. Doom's comic is great. You are huge, <laughs> which means you must have huge guts. <laughs> Fuck you, Doom guy is best, and that's why they put that dialogue in Doom Eternal. Fuck you. I, I was gonna say, I get the feeling that the guy, whoever it, it, the, the, as it aid, looked at the actually found a copy of the Doom comic, like this is our guy for Doom Eternal. Mm-hmm. Well, it, technically, it that now makes circle. him canonically. Like that makes him canonically the Doom guy in every Doom game, except for Doom Three, which didn't actually. Stark Doom guy, but that's a different story. That's a different rails. Rails. Yeah, I rails getting, myself here. Rails. Getting ba- getting back on the, <sighs> getting back on the rails. After after that after that went down. Now it's now it's time for us to address one of one before we get to some of the other Ega entries. We have to address an unfortunate elephant in the room. There seems to Which be a, one. Let's talk about the sixty. Let's talk about the N sixty four era. Brief as it so, is. Yeah. So you're yeah, talking maybe. about the era that technically begins with Castlevania Legends on the Game Boy. Legends, I can, Legends, I can't, I can't really cover because um, it was, it was a, it was with a lot of with a lot of Game Boy games that they were essentially gimped ports of any of NES titles or 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 the like, and um, le, and I think from what I remember of Legends, it was cer- it was certainly in that vein. Um, I do I do know that the character who was in Legends was go, was going to be in the Castlevania game on the Dreamcast, but that never came to be. And yeah. because Sonia and, Belmont, mm-hmm. the first Belmont to become famous, and because of Lament of Innocence, which we'll get to in a minute, um, she's been she's been written out of canon. Uh, no, because Lament of Innocence, um. Is is main story, Castlevania Legends, Castlevania sixty four, Castlevania Legacy of Darkness, and Castlevania Circle of the Moon are all considered AU. They're an official AU. Tent- yeah, tentatively they're referred AU, to. They're, that means they're not part of the main canon. Mm-hmm. Yes, but because of the the what was already established in Symphony of the Night of the castle takes many forms mm-hmm. in many places. Uh, yeah. You're, you're, again, you're not wrong. I'm just saying we're talking. It's not part of the official main timeline. It's part of a different timeline, but it's still its own canon. It's just yeah. not the main canon. Yes. Yes. That I would. That we don't need now, to. Now, when it came when it came to '64, it seems like th- it seems like this was the moment where they where they tr- where they tried to they they re- they had re- they had realized wh- that they had realized that that three that um. They couldn't ignore the three D thing forever, which actually, the, yeah. actually, I, I take that back. That's not entirely the case because, as I understand it, sixty four was done by a completely separate studio from Ega's. 
since the way a lot the way a lot of a lot of companies like Konami and, and others worked, especially around that time, is separating their project into a series of fiefdoms, and even and even more so, separating the divisions within that project into into their own little sub fiefdoms, and not to mention that this this uh. This Castlevania actually tried to base itself in Trasl in Transylvania. Yeah, granted, granted they were granted they were kind of trying to lean into that with with Bloodlines, with how much Bloodlines is ta is trying to take notes from Bram Stoker's Dracula. Mm -hmm. But the I think the the big the big problem was I don't th for starters the ideas that they that they wanted to do. With something like the N64 was already going to be a problem because the N64 was not the easiest to pro to um program for. There were there were a, there were a lot of limitations you had to work around simply because of it be, being in cartridge versus CDs. It's also the reason why, say, Doom 64 doesn't have all of the monsters from Doom 2. Although one of them they didn't completely take out, take out all the way because the Revenant's missiles are still in the game as a trap. Um, but you, and gr and granted, do, I'm not I'm not slagging on Doom 64. It's certainly an, it's certainly an interesting game. But the fact is, they had because there was so much space, there was a bunch of stuff they couldn't keep. And when it, but the big the big problem with with um 64 was. The idea, the idea of 3D movement on that on that kind of action game, was some was with that amount of precision, was something that hadn't really been tried. You look at a lot of the you look at a lot of the 3D platformers and the like, around this time. A common factor that you see is very open areas and ve and very relatively, relatively, forgiving platforming. This, I believe, is is a compensation for the for the fact that the N sixty four, is um D pad, or ra rather, it's attempted at a con it's attempted at a stick, which isn't re which isn't really a stick. It's a, it's just an eight way D pad, is not very precise. And because of because of that, you ha you had um you had a l that's why you had a lot of the um platforming issues with 64 and also the fact that um the whip only going one direction like that after after so long of having omnidirectional and freeform whips was asking for trouble yeah in fact in fact I think for the N64 they would have been better off not using a weapon using a sword or something simply because a freeform whip would be a nightmare to pro is a nightmare to program with current technology Mm-hmm. Trying to do that with the 64 tech? Yeah, good fucking luck. Yeah. Now, I never played the expan I never played the expansion Legacy of Darkness, which had which took which had control of the werewolf. From what I've seen, no. it's bet it's better. But it's slightly better, but here here's the thing, actually. Uh, I, I remember looking in on this. What it actually what happened with um Legacy of Darkness and Castlevania 64 was not too far was not too unsimilar to Sonic 3 and Sonic and Knuckles that it was supposed to be one complete game but because of limitations they had to rush out the the second half as the main game and then Legacy of Darkness would come out later as a prequel. Mhm. Mm Proof of that is because one of the characters from Legacy of Darkness appears in 64. Yeah. Now, wh now, um, the bit, the but unfortunately, as the saying goes, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And with with how st with how stiff sixty four was, and how it, and um, I I'd say if rem remind me remind me did si did sixty four come out before or after Symphony of the Night? After two years. After. after. That's another thing that did not work in its favor. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, but then two years after uh, Castlevania '64, in the same universe, uh, we get 
a fantastic game that is I I feel severely underrated. Which one? Circle of the Moon. Mm-mm. Circle Which, of the Moon. That that brings it that brings us back to to the to the e to the Ega lineage because once because um the the smartest thing that they did was move was move over to ha- move over to handhelds so that they wouldn't have to deal with the 3D arms race. Fun fact: Circle of the Moon was the first Castlevania to sell one million copies. Mm-hmm. And it's- yet, Ega strikes that personally has struck in this one from canon. Mm-hmm. Well, again, it's over in the in the apocalypse timeline now, so it, it isn't it, it it isn't part of the main timeline anymore. Anyway, yeah. That be that being said, i i will I will confess I will confess something. I ended up throwing out this idea, but there but um, when Double was coming around, I had I had honestly considered make. Um, set t- setting out a double driver using the DSS system from <laughs> Circle of the Moon. <laughs> I because think think about it. You have you ha- on one hand you have the you have the element, and on the other hand you have the form it's going to take. And I ended up making this joke when when I saw when I first saw the Ga- the Gaia memories in Double. So yeah, it, you had the, the attributes and the action cards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it so it wouldn't it wouldn't be t- it wouldn't be too hard to pull off. There would obviously be some cards that that just w- that just wouldn't work, <laughs> specifically the summoning ones. Like there's no there's no way there's no way that's there's no way that's gonna work. But but beyond that, I c- beyond that, it's cer- it's certainly not um, outside of the realm of possibility. Um. When, but when it comes to when it come, but when it came to the when it came to Circle of the Moon, the big the big problem was, as I mentioned before, we went live. The gra- graphically, you needed a light. <laughs> you needed yeah. a light, or you needed to be playing in a ver- in a well lit area. Now, if you're or playing, you at, need to have an SP. Which um. I can't u- I can't use that particular argument because Circle of the Moon was a launch line game for I know. the Game Boy Advance. Yeah, I know. It was one of those things that retroactively was easier to deal with, but at the time it was released, yeah, it was a pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I I definitely understand that. Um, as I wasn't able to get to the Game Boy Advance games in general until well after the release of the Game Boy Advance SP. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to play all these games through with a nice backlit screen. Yeah. Uh... Now, obviously, there's one entry in in the GBA trilogy that 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 needs no introduction. But there is, but there is one, uh, there is one other one that um that I think I think gets o- I think gets overlooked by a lot of people because it's it is still really damn good. And it's the start of main series of the second half of the main series. Mm-hmm. That being Harmony of Dissonance, or its better name, Concerto of the Midnight Sun. Mm-hmm. I love yeah. that. I knew that by that name because of the fact that I very first played Harmony of Dissonance on a GBA emulator, and it Ooh. was the Japanese version with an English patch. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they they had changed the. In the text on the title screen to read Concerto of the Midnight Sun. I'm sorry, that's a that's such a cool fucking name. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. it certainly fits the it certainly fits the theme. Whereas yes. um a name as now th- admittedly this is the music snob in me talking, but uh, um the phrase harmony of dissonance is ki- is kind of self defeating. Yeah, it's an oxymoron. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it is. But it, it was playing up the trend of the games, the three word t- uh, titles with the with the word of in the middle, like mm-hmm. Symphony of the Night, Circle of the Moon, Harmony of Dissonance. Aria yeah, of or, Sorrow. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Harmony of Dissonance came up before Aria of Sorrow, so. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Legacy and, of Darkness. Yeah, that was kind of a trend for Castlevania games for quite a while after the success of Symphony. Hell, Rondo of Blood. So it's been around for a lot, a long time. Mm-hmm. And I feel I 
I'm of I'm of the opi- I'm of the opinion that artificially shortening your shortening your pool of potential titles for so- for something is not is not the best idea, and uh, and um, I and the I think I think anybody who suffered through dis who I won't say suffered but put up with episode titles from Disney era era Power Rangers knows the pain of this kind of thing. I was actually thinking about oh. that myself. No. Something I'd, I'd actually like to point out about this of thing, without the, sh- the shortening from Power Rangers. No offense, that's... I don't want to think about that pain. I, I feel mm-hmm. you. I feel you, Sam. Don't go there, dude. Don't go there. But no, don't. Not only was the the word of word, or word of two words, because sometimes you needed the in front of it, uh, from the English version, you could actually see this in the um in the Japanese names uh, with Rondo of Blood, Akumajo Dracula X Chino Rondo Chino Rondo, mm-hmm. uh, Akumajo Dracula X Gekka no Yaso Kyok, which is literally translates to Nocturne in the Moonlight. So Symphony of the Night makes mm-hmm. sense there. Mm-hmm. Um, the only one that actually breaks this uh this whole set of something of something in the Japanese nomenclature are, uh, again, in the Castlevania Apocalypse uh, alternate universe, you've got uh, for for Legacy of Darkness it was just Akumajo Dracula Mokushiroku Gaiden which is a side story to just Mokushiroku which is the original Castlevania Apocalypse and it was also called Legend of Cornell in some places. And then Circle of the Moon was outright in English. It was Akumajo Dracula Circle of the Moon in English lettering. Mm-hmm. But uh, Harmony of Dissonance as Concerto of the Midnight Sun or Byakuya no Kosoku Kyok uh, was... I just... I love that name. I will never not think of Harmony of Dissonance as Concerto of the Midnight Sun. No, I, I, yeah, also, Circle of the Moon breaks the trend, a different trend, because... Notice that all of the Castlevania games from Rondo to Ar- uh, to Sorrow all had a musical theme to the name. Rondo Indeed. of Blood, mm. Symphony of the Night, Harmony of Distance, Aria of Sorrow. Circle of the Moon is the one exception to that. Yep. There's, there's also... Uh... Other games that we'll get to right now, and uh, right after we discuss more of Concerto here, mm-hmm. um, that have an of, but also are not musical. But it's still that whole something of something that just seems to be like a really big thing for them in this in the games at this point. Ega himself must have loved that naming trend because he kept that going for a long fucking time. And they weren't bad names, so obviously he was right. He was on to something. <laughs> yeah. Um. Now, when but, one of the one of the th- one of the things that I always find fascinating with um with this particular entry was something that they did for the larger enemies where they did where because this was this was my first introduction to um to pup to sprite puppeteering where um. Where the where the the pieces of the larger enemies were all their own sprite and just kind of moved. Yeah. Like but, with um Frankenstein's monster. Mm-hmm. The uh, the other th- the other um the other th- the other thing about the other thing about it is this is I'd say this is where we I'd say um there was one other there was one tradition that we we um ca- we kind of we kind of saw in in Symphony of the Night and retu- and returned here and that is the hit and that is the hidden character. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, Circle of the Moon had hidden modes, but it was just different variations, and you were still simply playing as the main character, just in different ways. Mm-hmm. Whereas here, you could unlock the ability to play as the main, uh, not only the secondary character, mm-hmm. uh, Maxim. Yes. Who. Has a, who has a far simpler play style, m- m- because well, he's not he's not meant to be the main. Um, hey, it's hey. basically a case of like the, the comparison here is Juiced is to Alucard as Maxim was to uh, Richter. Mm-hmm. I 
I, I actually, because of the way Maxim plays here, likes to think that Iga may have used Maxim as inspiration for Zangetz, but uh, we'll get to that in later game. Yeah. Now, the other the other thing the other thing to note is that th is that um with Harmony of Dissonance, this was the f this aside from the fact that it was it was a, it was essentially a direct sequel to a previous game to a previous game, in this case a sequel a direct sequel to uh, Simon's Quest. You also have you also have the fact that it brought it um put a renewed focus on sub weapons through the through the orb system. Yes, which um, it it also did something really unique with the Belmonts this time around, uh, because this this member just is a combined bloodline between mm -hmm. the Belmonts and between uh, the Belnades. Oh, nice. mm -hmm. Yeah, and that makes him not only the inheritor of Vampire Killer the Whip and you know just the vampire hunting. Uh, fun that comes with being a Belmont, but also an inheritor of fantastic magical fucking powers! Ooh. Again, yeah. Concerto of Midnight Sun was so good. Oh my god. It was the last game where we got to play a fully powered Belmont. Proper. Yeah, you know that, you know... No, never mind, I'll discuss that when we get to a later game. I have a point to make there. Now, when it can... Now, um... Obvious, obviously, when it came, obviously when it came to um, now the I'd say I'd now circle of circle of uh, circle of the moon was certainly was certainly um dip was certainly difficult when it came to its when it came to its um, um platforming. Whereas harmony of dissonance was a little bit more forgiving. Whether that makes it easier is um is ult is ultimately up to you. Yeah. Um. It was easier in certain types of platforming, but it did scale things as you got relics, much like any other Metroidvania will do as you get more. There are certain things you just cannot access unless you really know how to abuse the system sometimes. <clears throat> uh, you know, it'll start scaling things to, you need this relic to go here. Uh, so, like, the Griffin's Wings to get the super long jump. Yeah. I <sighs> Now, I have seen some people critique... Um, Harmony of Dissonance's graphics for using too much gray and reddish, or um, or the or the uh, sprite design. Personally, I d I don't mind it. It has it has a bit of a manga like feel to it. Yeah, um, I I think the only problem I had was some of the backgrounds during boss fights getting hard on my eyes, specifically the Maxim fight. Oh yeah, um, that. That was I. That was I. I torture. N just. Mm. But beyond that, if you look at any of the the screenshots from the game that are available on the internet or available on the wiki or anywhere else, the game it looks like a scaled up GBA game. It mm -hmm. looks like a GBA game that was also designed with the backlight in mind at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I think they I think they learned their lesson when it came to when it came to when it came to graphics being too dark. Mhm. Mm That's again why they used a lot of bright pop out colors and again why you get eye eye bleeding moments at the Maxim fight cuz I imagine that that fight would not look nearly that bright in your eyes if you're playing on a normal GBA. Mhm. Mm but since by this point most people probably had the SP um the backlight made that go. My eyes, they burn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still a fun fight. Still a fun fight. Mm -hmm. Um, this is, and of course, this is also where we instead of instead of having backward dashes, this was also the first time we got backwards and forwards dashes, which um, I kind of wish would be a standard. I mean, back dashes have become a standard, but back and forward dashes, I think, should be, or fuck, or fuck it, eight way dashing. <laughs> Make it eight-way dashing a relic ability. Mm -hmm. Um, and if and if if that ends up being if that ends up being implemented for Bloodstain Two, I want my I want my pay I want my payment in I want my payment in check. <laughs> um, 
Now, uh, one you're, other you're going to be you're going to be sitting on your hands, uh, uh, waiting for a check like that. As long as I'm going to be sitting on my hands, waiting for a check from Tight Kubo for his idea on a Shinigami Quincy uh, or, uh, visored that I made a joke character of two years before he revealed that about Ichigo, <laughs> you motherfucker! Down, down, boy, down. Anyway, one other aspect of these games because I remember, I remember uh, we, going back to that retrospective we talked about earlier. From what I've heard, Igarashi wasn't as hands-on with these two product projects as he was working on other stuff at the time, which will tie into the next game in the lineup because this is where he decided to make sure that the next game would be worthy of being canon. That's where we get to Aria of Sorrow. And Oh yeah, this is this is mine. Mm. <laughs> I got this. Mm. And the First off, while I while I will defend Harmony of Dissonance, I will also I will also admit that of the three games in the GBA era, Harm um, Aria of Sorrow is the best of them. Well, that goes without saying. Yeah. That now that's that's that said. The one one particular move that it that it takes that I that I was always. I was all I was always I was always kind of confused and, and intrigued over is the is the decision to try to try and have the try and have a end um, sen, um, scenario that we didn't that we didn't really see you're talking yeah. about the uh, Julius Belmont in, initiative mm-hmm yeah the fact so, that he apparently defeated Dracula in 1999 which we never got to see. No, okay. No, so this is, no, this is this is this is the point that I actually was going to make earlier, but said we, I would save till a later game. So this is actually a genius moment by Konami, not a bad moment. They knew that if they ever made the game that starred Julius and showed the epic final battle between Julius of the Belmont clan and Dracula. They'd never be able to make another Castlevania again. It could never reach the same heights. They avoided that hype bomb altogether. They made a, a game after it with a new person, Soma Cruz. Uh, it's a stroke of genius because if at any point they had wanted to create some sort of save us from bankruptcy, oh dear God game, um, they could make this. They could set it out. The hype would be there, and so long as the quality was there, uh, they'd make bank. Um, th th that's this is my personal theory behind it. Obviously, I don't have actually any insight to what the actual choices were, but it's it's what makes the most sense given what we know about Konami. Yes, yes. Of course, modern day Konami would completely fuck it up. Let's call a spade a spade here. Mm -hmm. Well, e Ego's not with them anymore, so of course they'd fuck it up. I, I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yeah, the, the, that the storyline aspect of Ariasar or Minuet of Dawn, as it was called in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, was was actually very intriguing. Yeah, you're we're we're going all the way to 2035. That's already a huge jump as it is, and then you've got the the potential new Dracula because he has the power of Dracula in him. He's just not actually fully Dracula. At least if you play the game correctly, he's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I love that's actually my favorite ending. What are you talking about? <laughs> What's well, you? That doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> but what really made that work is they implemented that not just in storyline, but in gameplay with the introduction of the soul system. Uh, the, TS, the TSS in this case. Because yeah, man, this you, this is the peak. This is the peak of Castlevania gameplay. This is the soul, yes. the soul system is also the bane of our existence, because there was there was a thing that I felt wasn't explained very well in the first game that was better explained in its sequel was that the more of so one soul you had the more powerful that soul would get yeah they didn't implement it properly in Aria which is why I think they went and tweaked it for dawn which we'll get to mm -hmm. but yeah you had four you had four different types of souls well three that you three equipable and then you have ability souls which was the Relics. stand in for all the uh, yeah the, the the power ups you would normally get double jump and slide and all that shit but you had bullet souls which were basically your sub weapons 
Guardian Souls, which you could basically activate with the trigger button to basically have a like a, a temporary thing that formed, like usually like a, a temporary invulnerability, shape shifting, summoning a familiar, which including a JoJo's reference there. I n don't think we didn't notice that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hell, even Proton John fucking noticed that shit. Yep. <laughs> Hell, he called out a common Rider reference in there. Two of them, in fact. Yeah. The Medusa Head Soul was very useful in the final boss. Oh, let's, absolutely. Let's also not forget that um the head the um Head Hunter Soul <laughs> is OP, um pure stat wise. <laughs> if you're willing to grind for it, it absolutely is. But that that brings me to one of that brings me to one other thing. And um, Proton John had 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 brought this up when he did it, when he did his Let's Play of of Dawn of Sorrow, but the ah, Arya. He did Arya, Ar not Aria. on. Arya, sorry. Um, but the luck stat is bullshit. <laughs> no, it when it comes to soul collection, it absolutely is because even if you max it out, it the amount of the the uh, the chance the increase of chances to get a soul on pure luck stat alone is so minuscule, you're wasting your fucking time. If you want to have a better chance at souls, you get that ring. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you have that ring and you have nine 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 luck, you have one hundred percent chance to get souls from all monsters. Yeah, but how the hell do you get to that level of luck without grinding for hours on end? That seems kind of dumb. You, you, you're asking how a completionist who already grinds for hours on end to get nine of every soul. Grinds for hours on end to get maximum luck to get nine of every soul? You answered your own question. <laughs> you know what? I you actually deserve have that. A, <laughs> I, I have a button here for that. You really have no life, do you? I have a life. In fact, if we're going to use an old meme, I'm a gamer. I have many lives. <laughs> you you uh, ran into that one. You yeah. ran into that one. You Brent deserve that. Cringy, but yes. Now, when... <laughs> yep. Let's get let's get the sideshow Bob. Let's get the sideshow Bob out of, out of our system. But moving on. When it comes now, I I will also I would also be remiss if I didn't point out one of the greatest troll moves in um, <laughs> especially towards completionists. That is the Iron Golem. Uh, uh, I I am con I am convinced that was a troll job. There is no, it's a, it's in a room that is completely skippable. You're you're only gonna go in there if you're a completionist, and it is and um it and the most reliable way to to beat it is with a weapon that is otherwise useless. <laughs> and you know what? I still got that soul. Oh, I I did I did too. And then you probably ended up when you ended up looking at its actual HP, you probably ended up doing a spit take like I did. No, um, I. So at that point, I was used to to games doing that thing with insanely high defense of one type, but very low, uh, very low HP, and the, and other defense types broke right through it um, because I had been playing Star Ocean games. <laughs> and, um, and we don't we don't talk about the fact that in Star Ocean games you can kill things by emptying them out as of Star Ocean Three. <laughs> yeah, and there's a reason why that didn't happen. That hasn't happened since. I know. Can't imagine why. Well, because they have significantly less MP than the fucking hundreds of thousands of HP they usually get. <laughs> but that's a different game series that we may talk about at another time. Yes. Now. When, um, it didn't. It when it comes now when it came to when it came to Soma as a as a character, a lot of people did make allusions to Matthias Kronkfist, i.e., who i.e. the Dracula before Dracula. Yep. Uh, which will which will be which will be covering um shortly. But when it when it this i this idea of. I feel like this idea of reincarnation was him was him taking notes from um, sixty four because if you recall, Malice was a reincarnation of Dracula in that in that game. 
Just yes. to, just mm-hmm. do, just doing the idea somewhat um, better. Because well, it, especially considering that Dracula's soul didn't reincarnate into one person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, 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 there were three candidates, each who got a different part of Dracula's power. Soma got Dracula's power over the command of souls. The power of dominance. Power of dominance. Yes. I just think it sounds better when it says he can command all souls. It's not yeah. just domination at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, well, who's who's who said that they had a special place of Arya sorrow in their heart here? I mean, I, I heard like five guys, didn't I? That was me. <laughs> Go forth, my friend. Aria of Sorrow is a great. Uh, Aria of Sorrow is great. It really, it I think it brings the the two D gameplay to a peak with the soul si- with the soul system. Link uh, li- it has a really good uh, connection to the narrative of you know you have this guy going through the game with dominance over monsters and the ability to use their powers, and then you find out that he's actually the lo- the lord of chaos himself, Dracula. Which makes total. Which w- when you look back at the rest of the game, you're like. Well, it totally makes sense that he that he that it totally makes sense that he's commanding all of these things. Now, I'm, so you have that nice retroactive, you know, gotcha. Um, great music. We haven't talked much about the music in this uh, in this uh, episode, but um, uh, Yamane. I'm pretty sure it's Yamane here too, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Um, so Yamane, Yamane, she was the. Uh, Composer for most of the games, wasn't she? Most, uh, except a harmony, except a harmony of dissonance. She did not do that one, and everybody yeah. noticed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Michiru Yamane was one of the three main composers for Aria of Sorrow. Um, Michiru Yamane's uh, sound is very, very. You, it's very specific. You can hear it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was she was principal composer. For Bloodlines, Symphony of the Night, um, the Boss Rush tracks for Harmony of Dissonance, uh, uh-huh. Aria of Sorrow, Lament of Innocence, Dawn of Sorrow, Curse of Darkness, Portrait of Ruin, the Dracula X Chronicles, but only for the songs Nocturne and Mournful Nocturne, uh, Order of Ecclesia, and then, unfortunately, they've been using some of her stuff for... Mm. Pachi slot. Oh no. Yeah, mm. and she's the compose the the principal composer for the mobile game Grimoire of Souls. Oh lord. Mm. I feel very bad for her right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, feel very bad for all of us. Yeah, well, she's got work. <laughs> she's got work, I guess. So, well, she's uh, also got work with Iga. She worked on. <laughs> she works. It worked on Bloodstain too. So yes, there you go. Yeah. yes, she did. But when it comes now, when it comes to when it comes when it came to the when it came to the material afterwards, because it was only an, it was only a matter of time before we started seeing another tr- another um, trilogy on the d- on the DS, and this is where things get um, interesting. Now, first off, we given how popular. Um, how popular Aria of Sorrow was, it was obvious that a follow-up was going was going to happen, even though um, at the, the time... The, ca- the, the canon ending doesn't make sense if that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. It'll... It's... It's one of... It's one of those... Th- it's one of those... Well, not only that, it's... I always... I always was wondering what, what the point... What the point of it was. Sim- simply because... Simply because, um... There wasn't a whole... There wasn't a whole lot of... Ro- a whole lot of room to go with. If you... If you re- if you really want if you really want to do this kind ca- this kind of thing, you're gonna have to do some ass pulls. And their their answer to an ass pull is, well, there there are these other people who are born the who are born on the same day, and thus and thus they could be Dracula candidates. But, Which isn't really much of an ass pull, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But and it's and it also has to deal with a uh, a priestess forcibly awakening their powers. And then forcibly awakening Soma's too. He's like, wait a minute. This is it's even at the at the at the beginning of a uh, of Dawn of Sorrow. Uh, you uh, <laughs> when Soma first gets that first skeleton bullet soul, 
and you can throw the bone. Mm-hmm. He's like, wait a minute, this is the power of dominance. But I thought it was sealed away when we put when we put Dracula's castle away for forever. Like he he's freaked out because mm-hmm. he shouldn't have those really? powers anymore. And and then that priestess is all like, hey, yeah, um, we need you around so that we can bring Dracula back. So I'm giving you your powers back. Bye. Which was honestly the stupidest thing she could have done. <laughs> yeah, you're giving, your pow- you're giving the powers back to the guy who stopped the plot last time. Are you fucking stupid? Yeah, what did you think was gonna happen? He was just gonna join in. Oh yeah, let's revive Dracula. No, because if that were the case, you'd get the best ending of, Ar- of Arya's Sorrow, where Soma <laughs> turns into Dracula. Oh wait, I'm sorry. That's not the best ending for most other people. Um. <laughs> Soma Cruz is an excellent character because here we have a guy who is born into a fate that he does not want and spends his entire life suppressing what it, he what is actual what you know is in, repressing what is inside him to you know to be his own person. There's kind of a Hellboy thing almost comparison, as in you know a beast, you know this you know enormous you know bringer of calamity and destruction rejecting that fate and, you know, choosing to be their own righteous person. Um, his contrast with, you know, his white hair, his white coat, and the black, and the, uh, the black, you know, undershirt implies a little hidden darkness underneath the white. He's often paired up with a white, with a white bat, which is, you know, contradictory to Dracula's as well. Um, it's also implied that uh, Mina, the uh, the young priestess girl, I believe, mm-hmm. it could also be a reincarnation of Dracula's wife. So, Dracula's wife. So, and so them being together is sort of a, a second chance reunion for Dracula and his and his beloved. So that's uh, I. It that's a very very heavily implied canon. They've never said it officially, but it's heavily implied. So I I, I hold that close to my heart. Also, um, let, let's um let's let's skip let's um let's skip let's address one other elephant in the room. His Japanese voice actor is Hikaru Midorikawa. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Let's also I I also like to in, in inclusion to the whole a second chance with his wife thing. Um, the fact that uh, Soma and Ari Kado <clears throat> <laughs> get along so well is like a second chance for father and son. Yeah, that too, that too. Mm-hmm. Ari Kado, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know who that is. I don't know what it was. Well, he's got no connection to all this. There's, there's no way that that's not just more Jap- Japanization of, of another name. No. Ari Kado is a perfectly normal name. I yeah, I don't. I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Come on, what 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 the hell, man? <laughs> I'm clueless here, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that does beg the question because almost every member of that cast has a connection to the past. You know, you've got Soma, who's Dracula. Mina, who could be Dracula's former wife. Julius Belmont goes without saying. Get Ari Kado, and you have Yoko Belnades, a descendant of the Belnades clan. Mm-hmm. Where the fuck does Hammer fit into all this? <laughs> you know, Hammer? could possibly be descended from Grant. The big, the mm-hmm. the big problem is, well, Hammer is obviously an alias. So, so whoever whoever his connection whoever his connection is in that regard, it's impossible to tell. For all we know, he may be connected to the shopkeep that was in the, that was in the castle during Alucard's era. Or the or since 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 he's involved with weapons, the the man who um who was the original who was originally the creator of the whip. But eh, uh, uh, I think we're uh, uh, yeah. It's too, it is it is an ass pull. I will I will freely admit that. <laughs> Say that uh that hammer. Less, less than being a descendant from anyone. You know, you know what that reminds me of, Hammer Studios. That was actually prob- according that was to the probably, <laughs> probably worth actually according to the uh, according to the Castlevania wiki that they're agreeing with that. His, quote: His name is probably a reference to Hammer Film Stu- Productions. 
There you huh. go. I mean, it is. It it makes sense. Yeah, but it's still like again, all the other characters have some connection to the Castlevania uh, franchise as a whole. He's the only notable exception. If he's a reference to Hammer Studios, he's a reference to Castlevania, the game series Origins in B movie Universal Monster Universal Monster eh. movies. Hammer uh, Horror. That's a more tangential relation. That doesn't count. Well, and I'd like to I'd like to point out that since Arya and Dawn of Sorrow are supposed to basically be a news story, they're not they're not a story of the Belmont Clan. They're the story of what happens after the Belmont Clan has technically already finished their uh their mission finished their mission yeah yeah so in that respect i would say that hammer could be an indication of the new rather than of what is old Mm -hmm. i like that better not to mention he's a guy who uh left the military uh because he didn't like it anymore and just wanted to sell weapons to a guy who can control people's souls (laughs) <laughs> Hammer. when you say it like that well, Hammer so- is there something about world domination that we don't know you have interests in <laughs> also just, I mean Dra- Dracula's castle appears out of an eclipse suddenly to- you know disrupting you know the wet disrupting the weather and time and space and he decides hey I smell a money making opportunity here I'm gonna yeah, open I'm up a shop I- right on ground zero I've been transported to this castle up here in the middle of an, in the middle of an eclipse, and the only people around here that look like they ain't gonna kill me, one of them might just be a resurrection of an ancient an ancient evil lord. Fuck it, I'm gonna sell my weapons to him. Get on his good side while I can. <laughs> uh. But even even with even with all of the even with all of that. Um. Oh, a nice little. Uh, I, can I just add one little mm-hmm. thing, real quick, real quick? Um, according to the Castlevania Wiki, there was actually a small drama CD uh, that was um, that uh, is connected to Aria of Sorrow, uh, Dawn of Sorrow. It was. Uh, I think it was in like uh, one of like a a, no- a light novelization, or I, I don't want to say a manga, but it was like it was it, it was a uh, it was an extra on a piece of literature. And uh, it actually has, uh, it takes place after Dawn of Sorrow. It actually has death, be death, be Castlevania death, showing up in the middle of the night uh, at, at Soma's place. And he literally, and he's literally asked, hey, and death li- asks Soma, hey, you, want, you, you, you gonna be Dracula or not? And Soma's like, uh, no, I don't wanna be Dracula. And death is like, okay, that's cool, peace out. <laughs> um, that, that brings me to one nitpick that I, that I had with, um, with Arya of Sorrow. Because one of the boss fights is Death. And Death, th- this particular incarnation of Death has been a mainstay in ca- in Castlevania's history since day one. The Death European is- sight wielding, you know, thresher of souls. Yes. This particular, ver- this particular version of Death is, uh, is in the mythos considered Dracula, one of Dracula's right hand me- right hand men. And there, when he shows up, there is no dialogue shared between between him, between him and Soma. That is a that feels like a massive missed opportunity to me. I completely agree. Him, him, him Soma meeting Death in the clock tower. There should have been some kind of exchange between the two. Even he, if it, yeah, that... especially with how far you would be in the game, he would be like, "I sense my master within you." Mm-hmm. Something, something that you know, something that'll like set off like a like a, a flag in the player's head. You're like, say what? <laughs> Just, yeah, you, there there had there should have been some kind of exchange. I I completely agree with that. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing that I'm guessing that it was just a it was just a lack it was just a lack of time. Um, this, uh, either that or either that or a lack of space because well you've you've only got so much space on on cartridges. All right, well, fair enough, but then, uh, that, in, in Arya Star, okay, makes sense. Maybe they couldn't do that, and maybe they probably shouldn't do that because at the same time, you know, it kind of might give too much away. Mm-hmm. But then you get to Dawn, and he's in there too. And if I recall, he didn't talk there, he didn't talk there either. 
No, Boy. he did not. Which that is that is that is definitely a head scratcher. Yeah. He has been in every single Castlevania game. As far as I know, I don't think there's been a game he's missed. Mhm. Mm now, that br that brings me to what to one particular one particular thing I do have to address from da from Dawn of Sour onward, which was they decided to stop using Ayami Kojima. And I'd say one of the re one of the big reasons that Dawn of Sorrow kind of get kind of gets a bum rap is because of the art style change, going for a more a more traditional manga um, style. Makes sense no, though, because it's taking place in Japan. Base. I know the fan base was just tearing that shit up alongside Portrait of Ruin that got it the worst in my opinion. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Except both. Both are great games, and the art style is still great for both. It's just not the same. Yeah, I'd, it's, I'd really, say it's, it's the uh, the art it's design different. is really only in regards to the character portraits and maybe a couple of a uh, you know a couple of image uh, the images outside the game. The game the sprites themselves look pretty much exactly the same with only some minor tweaks. That brings so that really brings, I don't know what people were complaining about. That bring that brings me to that brings me to to um now the the complaint the complaint is one thing but. What I've what I've always been curious about is the why, and I'm going to I'm going to use Final Fantasy as a as a bit of a as a bit of a counterbalance for this. And JT, I brought this up with you last night. Oh, rem re remind me. In uh, in the development of Final Fantasy VII, oh yeah, char yes, yes, yes. character des character design duties were handed over to Tetsuya Nomura instead instead of instead of um, Yoshitaka Amano. <laughs> The reasoning given was that Nomura's more manga-esque style, as opposed to the very ukiyo-e-inspired style of Amano, would be e would be easier to translate into polygons. And Which is a dumb. It's an excuse. I. I don't. I don't. I don't necessarily see it that way because um, because even with current technology, it's kind of tricky to emulate Amano's um, style in 3D. Yeah, the closest we've gotten is Warrior of Light. Yeah. The the Dissidia games came the closest, though they made a very egregious error with Terra from Six. I don't ca really... I don't count the Dissidia games in that regard because what it's trying to do is a hybrid of Nomura and Am and Amano's styles. But the but the point the point is the st the um that that kind of reasoning, given the fact that they were working with er with early poly early polygons and the, and their only experience with polygons up to that point was a was a glor was a glorified tech demo of one battle scene from from a, from a hypothetical N6 from a, a hypothetical six when it seemed like they were going to be using the N64. So, so uh, I so I could understand that. It's also the same reason why why a French weapon like the FAMAS is utilized by American special forces in the original Metal Gear Solid. It would be it would be easier to translate because of how blocky that gun looks. So, but when it comes to when it comes to the art style change with Dawn, with Dawn of Sorrow, I never really get, I never really got the reasoning for this art style change because you're still using sprites. Yeah. Um, I think it, it makes sense because of uh, because of the fact that the game you know did technically take place in Japan in the first game, but also, um, again, it's it's a change of era when it comes to dawn of sorrow when when we go to further games past dawn of sorrow in other areas such as uh portrait of ruin at that point they had already changed art styles and were using the new art styles and everything but i also don't think that the change of art style was bad you, it may seem unnecessary but I it's think still good art. It, it it is. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not getting. I'm not getting on that. I, th I think not it's bad. More, it's just different. I think. I think the reason why there was such why there was such a change is because, um, because Dawn of Sorrow is a is a sequel to Aria, and be and um that and 
that kind of re- you know how you know how in certain in certain long ru- in certain long running series there's always that um always always that bit of awkwardness whenever voice actors end up changing it's the mm-hmm. same th- it's the same thing i know that yeah. feel um which is the reason why I don't have as much of an issue with this kind of art style for Portrait of Ruin. And actually, actually, Portrait of Ruin, it, I find to be a very fascinating game for some of the stuff that it does. I love Portrait of Ruin. Chiefly among them, the whole idea of of character hot swapping, which I... I'd Jonathan, like... Charlotte! Jonathan, Charlotte! Jonathan, Charlotte! Yeah. <laughs> oh, cut off! You know what? You, are are you preferring that I hold L at the start screen and get the Japanese name so I get Jonathan Shadato, Jonathan Shadato, Jonathan Shadato? <laughs> Can I hit him? Urge to Dave Rising. <laughs> oh, I managed to bane two existences at once at the same time. Double score. Uh, all right, that's it, Dave. <laughs> you might have deserved that, but. When, but um, that that now when it comes when it comes to there's also the fact that Portrait of Ruin um, I consider Portrait of Ruin to be a more puzzle leaning Castlevania. There's been puzzle elements throughout the series, but Portrait certainly dove headfirst into that aspect, which may, which I think I think with I think with time has helped it has helped it stand out to a certain degree. However, that brings me that brings me to the DS era's crescendo. That being Order of Ecclesia. Ah, it's the, the DS games. Um, now is is Order of the Ecclesi- is Order of Ecclesia shorter than the other entries? Yes. Yeah. It is. It. I also have. I also find it. Far, I find it very interesting. I vo- I always loved um Shinoa's character design, and there's also the fact that even by Castlevania standards. Order of Ecclesia is fucking hard. <laughs> I love yeah, it. It's the hardest of the DSvania games. Mm-hmm. There's also the fact that I, th- I think the reason why nobody gives, even though it's an, even though it's not Ayami Kojima, that nobody gives the same amount of flack to the to the art style in the in um, Order of Ecclesia is that it still lean, it still has a lot of Gothic leanings. Yeah, the the designer for Order of Ecclesia, uh, Masaki Hiroka, definitely cribbed a lot from Kojima's work. Mm-hmm. You you mean Kogarashi or Igarashi? Koji, Koga, well, I'm talking about Kojima's art style. Like you, you look at the character designs for for from Ecclesia, and there's a very similar vein to Kojima's era of character design. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I see what you're saying there. Um, let's just remember about the suicidal uh, glyph combinations you could put on. Oh, God, especially the final one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, why even give you that glyph if all it does is kill you and you use it correctly? That, fe- that, feels, like, that feels like something that a, um, that a point-and-click PC game would use. Right? And... Because the I won't as you, as some of you know I'm I'm always I'm always a fan of um th- of theming with it within games and within writing and that's why I have a soft spot for the fact that all of the that there was a lot and I mean a lot of use of Latin especially with the vast majority of the glyphs that Shinoa has access to are all La- are all Latin words or um, phrases. And of of course, of course, um, now gra- now gra- some now sometimes sometimes it's cheating where it's Latinized Greek because um, well Latin Latin is Latinized naming was was a was a th- was a thing in the old days and um I consider it the modern day version of um weebery. like when like when a massive weeaboo decides to try and give themselves a Japanese name because they think that they're smart. Well, Ecclesia is Latinized Greek. Mm-hmm. There, there's um, there's certainly there's certainly worse um, aspects of this kind of Latinization, like like say um, Gustavus Adolphus. Yep. <laughs> which, 
was was basically it was basically him t him taking his regular name and trying to make it sound more Latin. But <laughs> when, but there is, but there's no de there's no denying the fact that that, that um. Ecclesi I would I would actually say that Ecclesia is one is one of the harder games in in the uh, Metroidvania style period. Not just up, it's definitely the hardest of the of the DS era, but I'd say I'd say it stacks up with the, with the heavy hitters in that regard as well. Yeah. Um. And when there's a, when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the this brings us to some of the more unfortunate um, entries in in kind of the in kind of the side parts because right around this time there was also the there was also the attempt to try and put to try and put something on the Wii. Actually, I take that back. We'll hold off on that because we need to address the P we need to address the PS2 and 360 era as well, which starts with what essentially has become the origin story of the Belmont lineage, that being Lament of Innocence. Mm -hmm. Now, the I will get one thing out of the way. I despised the active menu system that it had. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure most people hated it. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of it either. What little I played of this game. Oh, uh, that be, that being said, I I will admit I do I do enjoy the tragedy of the origins. Now, yes, Walt. Walter Renard was was a was a was was not a whole lot to write home about. He was basically a means to an end. <laughs> a um, means to an end. But I did. But I did. Enjoy, I did enjoy seeing the origins of Le of Leon Belmont and Matthias Kronkvist. Also, it also helps. Exp it also helps go into why the why the hell um. Why the hell some somebody? Why the hell somebody with a very French-sounding name would be in the middle of Eastern Europe? I. Which is something that the anime also also touched on. Um. And the fa the fact that they the fact that they threw in nods to the Crusades and um, Matthias losing f losing faith, um, definitely, definitely, put, definitely um has been memorable for me, but. If there's one thing that's been memorable for um, mixed reasons, it is one of the more infamously hideous secret bosses in any Castlevania. That being the Forbidden One, the Forgotten <laughs> One, the, the Forgotten One. Which, um, how the hell did they get away with that? <laughs> <laughs> also, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that even though you're technically using the alchemy whip and the, and then later on the vampire killer um the way you end up using the whip it feels more it feels more like you're using a sword <laughs> am i the only one who thought that well really. again it's that it's that limited uh it's that uh difficulty in uh graphic animation of a fully flailing whip you know what i'm saying yeah. Um, it's it's a sword with extra reach, pretty much. Pretty pretty much. Pretty much. I w I will admit I um I do I do enjoy um Leon Bel Leon Belmont's design with that with bringing back bringing back a little bit of red when the, when we've had several generations of very bluish designs over the years. Mm. Yeah. But, and much much like with Soma, I want that coat. <laughs> Great coats are the best. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That and the that and the fact that in this case have, having a having a mismatched arm actually makes sense because that's your that's your blocking arm. Um. And I I know we've talked about secret characters and lament of in, lament of innocence is one case where they had a secret character who had I th I fe I find has a f has a very interesting. Playstyle compared to other secrets, because he's, assen he's essentially using a he's essentially using a bunch of um, summoned swords that he's throwing about. It's mm -hmm. just that he's throwing about them either in wide arcs or throwing them like spears.
uh, Joachim Armster was it was his name. Um, and of course, of course, this of course this is also where we get the in the introduction of the ebony and crimson stones, which um was which prompted which prompted one of the biggest kill steals in the whole series because you think you you think you've kicked Walter's ass and then death shows up and steals Walter's soul. Because, yep. Because because it, because if you're going to be a max if you're going to be a maximum dick, you may as well do so by, by kill stealing. But I'd say the I'd say um a bit I'd say a big um a big problem when it when it comes when it came to a game a game like this is they tried to, they I did not care for the map in um, Lament of Innocence. It was, well, map in the Mount of Innocence could be a little iffy. Clunk. I, I, I called it clunky at the time. I mean, it's kind of indicative of the PS2. Mm -hmm. Um, and as now, when it comes to when it comes to its follow up, Curse of Darkness, um, I did like I did like that that game gave an alternate perspective when it comes to seeing the Be seeing the Belmonts and everything else from the other side. By pl by playing as by playing as Hector, mm -hmm. but this is a this is a case of unfortunate timing because the idea of the whole gimmick with Hector is being able is he is a devil forge master who can create innocent devils to fight along to fight alongside him. Um, make your Pokemon jokes. I know you got them. <laughs> the unfortunate part is about a year before this came out. Capcom had did had done the familiar thing also with a game called Chaos Legion. Ah, Chaos Legion. Which um, now gr now blast. granted like that's the where blast from the past. Mm -hmm. Now granted that's where the comparisons begin and end, but the f but unfortunately uh, unfortunately it's not going to stop people from making the comparison. Even though it's even though truth be told, it's not exactly fair. I do consider Curse of Darkness to be a bit, to be a better game, though, and um, it also gave me an opportunity to laugh at games journalists when there were some really bad takes on the uh, review for the game from Xbox Magazine. Heh. <laughs> is a lot of a lot of people think that a lot of people think that this whole game journalist sucking thing has been a recent deal. No, this has been a problem for years. <laughs> yep. Um. But when. But I'd I'd say I'd say one of the I'd say one of the things that really stuck with me with um, Curse of Darkness is having um uh, having Trevor Belmont as a boss fight. And yes, I am partially saying that because he repeatedly kicked my ass. <laughs> Sorry, are we on Curse of Darkness now? Yeah. Yep. Ah uh, yes, one of Crispin Freeman's finest moments of acting. Uh, <laughs> indeed, that man is a legend. Just to hear him, just to hear him, from my boy. Just to hear him, just exuberate in that booming, you know, authoritative, deep voice of his in this thick East, this thick medieval European, you know, brogue. It's just, it's just, ugh, it's just. It's oh. a beast for the ears. Mm -hmm. Hear me, oh spirits of darkness! I'm like Jesus, Louise. Good old Crispin Freeman. Mm -hmm. My boy. Now, when it now when it comes, but again the the big the big problem when it came to when it came to something like um curse of when it came to something like curse of darkness is. They tr they also try to do this um, soft AI thing where you had different AI modes for innocent devils. Um, I think that was a little bit bleeding edge for the time. And you're putting a lot of faith in a you're putting a lot of faith in a in AI on a console. I don't ha I don't really do that because that's a that's quite an ask. Unless it's an RTS, that, that it's not never something you should do. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, and how many and how many are how many decent RTSs can you think of that are on consoles? Halo Wars. Okay, that's one. How many else you got? Uh, off the top of my head right now, when we're talking Castlevania, I don't know. My my point my point exactly. But no point here. <laughs> But that, but um, that bring that giving now given that we've co given that we've covered the P the PS two the PS two run because that's how I played the things. I don't know if any, I don't know if any of you played played Curse of Darkness on the Xbox. Not on the Xbox. Well, I didn't own a normal Xbox until way later. Yeah, I kind of I kind of figured as much. And for me, for me the X for me the Xbox was on more specific things. You know, Otogi and Ninja Gaiden. But mostly, but mostly. Midnight the... Run Three Dub Edition, the only place it currently exists, and Jet Set Radio Future, mm -hmm. the only place it currently exists. The original fucking Xbox. Yeah. But now it's time. Now I think it's high time that we have to deal with the some some of the unfortunate spin-offs around this time, and that brings me to Judgment. <laughs> we made it, boys. We made it. I love that game. The now I, I want to <laughs> I, I find that I find that judgment is a, is a bit is a bit misunderstood because the idea of a the idea of a Castlevania fighter is cer is certainly appealing and there's a certain other fan project that did it a lot better but the bit but there are two major problems with um with judgment one let's get something clear. Judgment is not a traditional fighter. It is a party fighter. It is on the it is on the same tier as the Naruto Ultimate Ultimate Ninja Storm games or Bleach um, Shattered Blade or, or any Smash game. Any 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 Smash game or any or any fight any fighting game that's directly based on on a po on a popular anime. Uh, My Hero One's Justice, One Punch Man, a hero that nobody knows, except ex um, Jump Force. If you're that, if you're desperate, etc., etc. I have to make an exception. While you'd be right when talking Dragon Ball Xenoverse, Dragon Ball Fighters is a legit fighting game. That's the exception to the rule, but the but the majority of the other um, DBZ fighting games are not. Yes, I definitely agree. However. And give and given the fact that it's that it's in a, that it's a literal arena fighter, a la a la um the likes of Power Stone, that's also that's also why trying to trying to apply it in the traditional fighter mold doesn't work. I bring this kind of thing up because a lot of people fell into this trap. They mm -hmm. the other the other issue is who is who the, is who they hired to do the character designs. Na and for and for whatever reason, their their name is current. Their name is currently uh, currently escaping me. For re for reasons that for reasons that I do that I that I do not know. Um. <laughs> yeah, fuck it. I'm I'm gonna look. I'm... <laughs> Cause this is gonna this to is pull. gonna this is gonna drive this is gonna drive me crazy. Have to pull a flutter. Takashi Obata, aka the person who is responsible for Hikaru no Go, the game that um, the game that got the one of the two anime that got that got that got JT and myself into uh, into traditional Japanese board games. Uh, and Go, which is more Chinese than Japanese, but okay. Well, there's all. I was I was also tempted to bring up Reach Mahjong, but that's a whole other ball game. <laughs> it all goes I, uh, back to China. Everything does in one somewhere. Um, Shogi does not. Yeah, but the but Shogi the other but job. the other thing that is that he was responsible for that was very big around this time, so people were going to make the comparisons is Death Note. Yeah. This, is, this is why it's a case of really bad timing, and it. Does it doesn't help that one of his designs looks way too much like Light Yagami, just red-haired? 
I argue it's kind of in comparison to Simon's design from the Castlevania Chronicles port. It he def, he had red hair in that one as well, but the but the point is the overall design, the haircut, the the way the fa the facial expression looks way too much like Light Yagami for a lot of people. There was yeah. There was also the fact that um cer that certain that certain ca certain um characterizations were com were um completely di were completely different from how from how they were normally. The biggest victim of this was Maria. Why? Just just fucking why? I have no idea. As as much as Sacred Gift became became a meme for me. <laughs> I have no idea why they decided to make that her ca her f character focus. Make matters worse, they made her into a fucking magical girl. Oh yeah, <laughs> fucking Maria! What the hell? No, no, the the the, uh, the one line that ruins Maria Menard as a character in that game. They're huge. <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it's okay to have a cup angst, but that shouldn't be your only defining character trait. Um, uh, there's all. Let's. Um, well, although, we did point out that this was a party fighter. Yeah, party fighters are are known for for what? Party fun humor yeah yeah there's wait it's not it's not like humor hasn't been hasn't been a hasn't been a thing throughout the series i mean i mean um yoko belnada spent spends way too much time teasing everybody including you <laughs> but there's there's a there's a right way and a wrong way to do to do humor and even even when it comes to other party fighters the they're not they're not trying they certainly have a they certainly have a lighter tone, but they're not trying to go for lol humorous, and, and also random. Was, yeah, and with some with some with some entries because they're trying to replicate arc, trying to replicate arcs from their respective anime, they can't get away with that kind of thing. Like you can with some several of the um several of the storm games that I mentioned are are um are replicating certain arcs. In uh, in the in the anime, and you can't go with the lol. You can't go with the lol random all the time with that. Um, which is which they which is why which is why as the as that series of all they didn't. Um. And when it com when it comes to but um, there is there is the bigger problem of for one. This was around that time when when there was the mandate of doing motion controls for everything, and motion controls for a fighting game is not a very good idea. And there was also the fact that we had that we had the most unbalanced roster I've e one of the most unbalanced rosters that I've ever seen this side of MVC two. No, I'm not letting that go. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, MVC two is more balanced than this. Let's awful baby. Let's get let's get one let's get one thing out of the way. Eric Lacard in, in Castlevania Judgment is broken. He they is fucking massacred my boy. Yeah, he's also he's also a uh, a Shoda. I might add. <laughs> oh lord, fucking bratty little Shoda looking at. Ah. Uh. Yeah, the, uh. they there's definitely there's definitely that, but there's all, oh, but the fact of the matter is. You get him, and it's an and it's an auto win because of it because, well, for one, it's his absurd reach, and two, his absurd damage and reach. Normally, when you have reach characters, they're they're pokers. They don't they're not meant to do a whole lot of damage. They're meant to play keep away. But fortunately for for the for those who for those who cut their teeth on Mugen, there was a bet there was a better solution in Castlevania Mugen. Which play, which played, which played very much like a 2D Castlevania control wise. It was just a, it was just a glorif, it was just a boss rush of a game. 
and actually included a lot of characters that we always wanted to try out, but never got never got the opportunity in the, in their particular games. Um, say Maxim in Circle of the Moon. And what? Why am I saying Maxim? What, what the hell am I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> you're like me. You're getting your you're getting your names crossed. It doesn't you're help that it doesn't it doesn't exactly hurt that they're both swordsmen. You're yeah. thinking of Hugh. Yeah. Let me ch let me check something. Cause it's been it's been a while since I and a pair a par apparently the apparently the original the original site that it was uh, that it was on has been ta has been taken off, which is unfortunate. Um. It's been it's been archived it's been archived elsewhere though. So th so thank God for thank God for small favors. <laughs> and thank God we aren't talking about Harmony of Despair. First, now first, we should. Harmony of Despair was an interesting experiment, but there's not a whole lot to there's not a whole lot to say beyond that. <sighs> It's a thing. Best co-op games ever made. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm not sure if I'm willing to go that far. And the 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 idea of it of of a of co-op castle exploring, I think would I think would be interesting if it weren't for the if it weren't for the fact that the castles are still way too damn big. Because with co-op, you're supposed to be work you're supposed to be working together. Now, if it was if it was a if it was used like a race, the si the size of the castle would be would be a little bit more um, manageable. Since you're not you're not supposed to be in the in cl in close in close areas to to other people if it, if it's in a if it's in a race. Um, and yes, I I will I will admit that having that having e having everybody. Um, from th from throughout the, th throughout the series was certainly done better here than it was in um, Judgment, but that's a case of praising with faint dams. Speaking of praising with faint dams, I think it's high time we tackle the Lords of Shadow trilogy. Oh yes, or as oh many have commonly called it, God of Ania. A term a term that I have issues with, but I'll get but I'll get into that. A term I have issues with because while these games are not the normal uh, Castlevania uh, formula, they're actually quite good. Now, well, I don't think it's a it's a damning of the game. It's just that the gameplay style is very similar to that of God of War. On pa on paper, again, I'll get I'll get to that shortly. The now for now first off, the idea of the idea of outs. This was around. This was around a time when a lot of Japanese um, IP ho IP holder companies were outsourcing. Capcom being the biggest one in this regard, because because of how successful Capcom Vancouver was with Dead Rising. Um, granted, they didn't have it much in the way of other successes because it was either de the only successes from that time were Dead Rising and Lost Planet, because stuff because some of the other stuff in their initiative, like say Dark Void, didn't stick. Um, but, Mer but um, Mercury Steam, who na who is now who is now working on Metroid Dread, was t was um was t was was in was, in they initially approached Konami about doing, a ca a Castlevania game that originally I th originally I think it was supposed to star Trevor. That was that was their original pitch. But Konami was hesitant on the matter, and they only they only really changed their tune when Hideo Kojima went to bat for them. And Kojima stayed along it as co as co producer when it came to um, when it came to Lords of Shadow. Although, tr truth be told, I, f I feel like I feel like um, I feel like Kojima's position in that was more of it was more of a Trying was more of a trying to protect them from Konami's bullshit kind of way. Yeah, 
Most definitely. And because because some as um there was this was this was also where I will admit I started to develop a resentment towards the people who had who had a um Metroidvania or nothing approach because a lot of, there was a, there was frequent complaints that um Lords of Shadow was too linear even though Mercury Steam made it absolutely clear they had no interest or desire to do the Metroidvania format that they were that the game that they were drawing their inspiration from was Castlevania 4 yeah and when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the God of War comparison, that's one that I find I find that to be ra to be a rather surface level remark for a couple reasons. For one, um, in both cases you're using a chain weapon, so how how so um how else how else are you going to use it? Are you get you are you going to use it like a long stick? Good luck, good fucking luck with that. Two. The the combat loop itself, once you have access to light and shadow magic, d does not does not pl does not play as much like God, like God of War as as um, people would think. God of War has a has a whole lot of even with that whip, um, God of War does not has a much bigger emphasis on area attacks than um than than Lords of Shadow does. Especially since with Lords of Shadow you had the dichotomy of wide attacks that don't do as much damage or direct attacks that don't have that are that are far more narrow. But more importantly is is a momentum system in the form in the form of the focus scroll, where as long as you keep attacking and you don't get hit, it'll build up, which will which will generate uh, magic spheres that you that you can absorb to replenish your light and shadow mat. Um, gauges, which is important mm -hmm. since shadow magic increases damage, whereas light magic recovers health every time you hit. And because of that, it al it's it almost ends up com it almost ends up coming off like an action version of Ikaruga than a than anything else. <laughs> um, it's not a full action it's not a full action Ikaruga because that's what Outland is for. Great game, by the way. But there, but there is very much that, very much that vibe, especially, especially in certain boss fights. That be that being that being said, what we, I do, I do find, I do find this, I do find this particular entry to be a to be a nice little origin story for the concept of um, Dracula. Just, I like just in a different matter. I like the fact that it that it basically turns uh the makes the Belmont clan's entire um quest to take down Dracula one of uh one of um rather than of of just we're vampire killers and that's what we do makes it more this is our repentance for our failure mm -hmm. especially and it, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure Patrick Stewart enjoyed enjoyed playing a enjoyed playing a villain for once. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Stewart's done some some good villains in the past. Yeah, oh, yeah. But he, but because of the because of the fact that everybody see every, that so many people see him as Jean Luc Picard, he doesn't get he doesn't he doesn't get as many. He's opportunities. Cast as a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Although. He does. He did a damn good Scrooge. He did a damn good um, Scrooge, though. Mm -hmm. Um. But when it com but when it comes to when it came to the when it came to the actual combat because of that, do dodging ends up becoming a lot more important because you because you want to in combat you want to keep maintaining that um that momentum so you can keep so you can keep replenishing your your stuff. There is the unfortunate side effect that um, sub weapons aren't as important. I mean, they they're not they're not shit, but but I'd say I'd say I'd say that the key that the core of it is still um, the whip use. So I get I guess in a way they were taking cues from Castlevania Four. <laughs> just 
in all just not in just not in the ways that we probably would have liked. <laughs> <laughs> but one per, one um but the this is also where I began I began to get a res, I began to develop a resentment with it f towards the fan base for one per, for one particular mindset that I that I kind of touched upon in the past and I'd like I'd like to revisit here. I resent the idea that a Castlevania game or a Castlevania like game has to use the Metroidvania formula even if the developers of the game don't want to. That doesn't make any sense honestly. I mean, it's uh, you've got to be willing to evolve and explore new possibilities or else you stagnate. Mhm. Mm and I know some I know some people have the idea that there's no that there's nowhere else that th that the that the linear format could go. I don't agree with that. There's plenty of avenues that can that can be taken with that and get and the and the fact that the fact that Curse of the Moon exists seems to validate my point. That and, that and the upcoming Lords of Exile, which is look which is looking really damn good. But when it come, but when it comes to when it came to the, when it came to this game, why should they do the Metroidvania approach when it do, when it doesn't fit their it doesn't fit the scheme and it doesn't fit what they and what they wanted to do to begin with? They shouldn't. And unfortunately, because of the fact that they wanted to try and appease the people that they lost, or because or because of Konami's pu Konami pushing them on the matter. The following two games after this, they ended up taking that approach, but at the same time, they tried to keep what they had before. We saw this with Mirror of Fate, where they tried to implement the same combo system, but get, but using a whip that had way too much reach. <laughs> and truth be t truth be told, the I the idea that they had with it of of doing of doing several generations of um Bel of Belmonts. Or rather, two generations and one and one of them get one of them getting a reskin. I'm not op I'm not opposed to the idea. Um, but again, again, I feel like I feel like trying to trying to use that combo ba that combo based approach from the from the from Lords of Shadow into this into Mirror of Fate was not a good idea. And there's also the fact that Mirror of Fate was nothing but a glorified setup for Lords of Shadow 2. It was a game to do a prequel. And when it comes to Lords of Shadow 2, <sighs> I, want whoever, I want whoever keeps insisting on putting stealth elements in games that are not stealth games to to be dra to be dragged off to be dragged off of off of the off of the back end of a ship. Huh. I fucking hate this particular trend. I hated it here. I hated it in Wind Waker, and I'm going to continue hating this particular concept until I'm dead. <laughs> um, in Wind Waker, it existed more because of the fact that it also existed in a uh, in Ocarina of Time. So, if you're gonna blame anybody, blame Ocarina of Time. Well, fuck, well, fuck that too. Because of the stealth section in the Gerudo Fortress. Yeah, I'm not. I'm perfectly fine with stealth games. I've I've cu I've cut my teeth on Tenchu way too many times. <laughs> Tenchu. What? Oh man, there's some memories. Yeah. Oh, oh, you, oh, you had, a, you had a nice little timer, so, so you could see how alert they are. Tough shit. You don't get that here. You get a set of symbols with, with sensing key, and you get no map. Yep. Still haven't played Tenchu Z though. I'm not sure about that. I haven't either. But I don't care for in, for implementing stealth sections in games that aren't designed for it. Largely because of the fact that when you do that, you have an AI system that is that does that isn't going to be as meticulous as a game that does have stealth systems, and thus you end up with bullshit, or pe or people being able to spot being being able to spot you when they when they really shouldn't have, <laughs> which, prob which probably uh, falls under the umbrella of bullshit. Ah, uh, don't you love bullshit though? 
No, that's why it's bullshit. <laughs> I enjoy difficult games, but uh, but I uh, but um I do not but I do not enjoy I do not enjoy um stupidity. I understand that. I don't enjoy stupidity either. Because if if I wanted to enjoy stupidity, I'd probably be I'd probably be still on Tumblr. Tumblr? <laughs> Why would you ever go to Tumblr? Hey, I had I um, it had its uses once upon a time. Once upon a fucking time. But more on but more on point, um. When it came to Lords of Shadow Two, the I do th I do think that there were two massive mistakes that they ended up making. One was, of course, the stealth thing, and putting the and putting those just after the tutorial was a massive mistake. Especially given the ridiculously awesome set piece that is fighting off a si fighting off a siege against your own fucking castle. Like, say what you will about how gim about how gimmicky that particular set piece was. The idea that you're f the idea that you're fighting off a siege by yourself is fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. It. It certainly doesn't hurt that the that the paladin that you end up fighting is no is no was um a very interesting fight, and you and the fact that he, the fact that um you had the you had the whole thing of of nuking the battlefield because he decided to try he decided to try praying you away <laughs> and forgetting it's hard to pray the it's hard to pray the uh the the good guy away. Yeah, because let, let's not forget, even if he did, even if he did fall, even if he did fall and become a vampire, he's still, he's still a cho, he's still a chosen one. Yep. <laughs> oh, you guys didn't think that, uh, that Dracula was the good guy? Oh, he totally is. Mm-hmm. Oh. Now, when it, now, I do think, I do. The other big, the other big issue was. I think I think setting Castlevania in in somewhat modern times, even if it was modern times by way of a bunch of fucking factories, was a mistake. And the idea the idea that the that the old castle is in your is in your head in that regard was um not the smartest move to make. And oh, he hello, Joel, welcome back. <laughs> Are you back? Eh? I'm back. I just forgot I was on the, the touch to uh, touch just <laughs> just put the kids to bed. Uh, ah. So I'm mostly gonna be listening. Yeah. No. No. Wor no worries, man. What? Thank. Your pr your what presence. What are we up to, by the your way? Pre your presence. Lords is of Shadow too. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. I will listen. Yeah. But now I I will I will admit. I did. I did like the. No, I did like the notion that instead of using the combat cross with Lords of Shadow Two, you're using a. You're using a Void Sword and the Chaos Claws, and then using a Blood Whip for your reg, for your regular attacks because old habits die hard. And inc incidentally, I can see. I can see myself making a, making a lot of uses of the concept of the combat cross in that regard. You know, a, a you essentially have a cross that has all that has a bunch of hidden weapons. So, I just I could easily visualize a whole series of of that combat cross with it with different configurations that have different um, weapons. One a hidden sword. One one um, having one having it transform itself so it could be used as a t as a pair of tanfa. Um, probably probably one, probably. If one. you're in modern day, you could do a combat cross that's a gun. Oh, well, wouldn't be the first time we had a gun. We had a gun in Castlevania, and fuck, Arya's sorrow had a positron rifle. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ain't that the truth? But, and I, I will admit, there, there are certain little details with the Lords of Shadow games that I liked. One of them being the, um, the way that it, the way that it, um, shows, co shows combos that you can do through, through those little sketch animations. I think I have several of those in in um, GIF form. They were a very nice touch. But 
ultimately, the, the thing that undoes the Lords of Shadow series, aside from the fact that by the time Lords of Shadow 2 came around, they didn't have Kojima's protection because he was starting to have his falling out with Konami's bullshit... And the, <laughs> and the whole thing of we need to we need to dive headfirst in the mobile because Dragon Collection made us a lot of money. <sighs> is the is surprising the... absolutely nobody with their abject stupidity. Mm-hmm. Is the is the fact that in I I firmly believe. That instead, instead of trying, instead of trying to appe instead of trying to appease the traditionalists and go and going f and going for a and going for this mi this mix of what they had and an and a more open world approach, they should have stuck to their guns and go and gone for a straight level based approach. Because when you look at the way the way ca the way um, Lords of Shadow 2's story is structured. Am I the only one who feels like it's it may as well have been a level a level based approach? Nah, I can see that. I mean, there is the whole the whole idea with with the with the castle exploration idea is that you are constantly getting teased with areas that you can't that you can't get to. Exactly. And the reward that you're getting from boss fights is to un, is to unlock more and more of the castle. But mm -hmm. the but um Lords of Shadow Two feels wait doesn't have doesn't have a whole lot of hidden areas and the ones and the hidden areas that you get is ju is just the same kind of get these kind of items to ex to expand one of your meters and that's not all that interesting um and I did f I did find that one of the gifts that I had that I had saved. So I'll put I'll put that in the council just so just so you can get an idea on, on what these kind of animations look like. Like I said, I thought I thought it was a nice touch that they did this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, check the council. Yeah, yeah. I thought the the combos with the with the combat cross there. Yeah. Um. If I have to be perfectly honest, um. Before I actually played the Lords of Shadows games and beat them, I I didn't deride them for being God of War likes, if that's what we're going to go with the, what it, what they were being called at the time, and that was the only thing I knew at the time. Mm -hmm. um, because I love God of War; those games are fantastic up until a certain point. <clears throat> up until yeah, a certain point. <laughs> and the reboot's actually pretty good too, but. I I I had just gone through a replayathon of all of the GBA and three and DS games on my computer because emulators are godly. Um, <clears throat> oh, I didn't say that. Loud. I had the cards too, but I just didn't. I had the carts, but I didn't have my my DS and GBASP on me. They were in storage. Um. And I, at the time, I just didn't feel like playing that type of of Castlevania game. And when I watched my my roommate playing it, I was like, "This this doesn't really hit my my sweet spot for character action games because it is a character action game. It just didn't hit my my sweet spot for it. I." I I felt like it was a little too simple compared to playing uh, at the time, you know, Bayonetta and and DMC Force and so on. Mm -hmm. But after playing them, I, they're fairly fun. They're and they're also uh, it's a, it's a specific type of experience you're looking for when you go in. It's, it's a very specific type of experience. And be, I think I think beca the I think the other I think the other thing is um I can't I can't help but I can't help but wonder if the negative reception to Lords of Shadow was also was a bit of shit rolling downhill because of, because of um how because of how poorly Judgment turned out. 
I think that may have been associated, but not in the same way. Um, a lot of people that I knew at the time didn't like Judgment, not because of all the changes to characterization, but because this isn't a Castlevania game, this is just a fighting game that you pasted Castlevania onto. Which, right. while true, does not any anyway make it less of a Castlevania game. <laughs> um, that's the, that, that, that was the biggest complaint I heard from lots of people complaining about Judgment at the time. Mm -hmm. So, I think the thing that was fresh in their minds was, well, one game that isn't a Castlevania game came out. Maybe Konami's just not going to make Castlevania games we like. And this all spreads back to the whole Castlevania games must be Metroidvanias that none of us here actually... Uh, none of us here are purists like that because that's mm -hmm. fucking stupid. No, nah, don't put it in a box, man. Like, Castlevania has been so much more than that prior to being a Metroidvania, and so much after. Like, it's so ludicrous to say, oh, I, my favorite thing has to be the thing it is. Nah. Castlevania is Castlevania, bro. I've, ma I've made it clear over the years that I, re I, resent the, I, I resent the idea of design by gospel, as I've called it. Where yep. you're not you're not you're not designing because it because it's where your idea is naturally going to, you're doing so because you because you because that's what you've always done. Even if, even if it doesn't even if it doesn't make any sense to do it, or if it does just doesn't work in that context. Mm -hmm. Might make sense, but then the context changes things so that you have to try a different way. I I really think that when it came to Lords of Shadow. Uh, it was it, the primary complaint at the time. It, I know it changed over time, but at the time was, this is not Castlevania. That's the big one I always heard. I was like, how, how, how is it? Not, the, the name Castlevania is on it. How is it? What? I always uh, got, I, I always did my own little ludicrous little, but the name Castlevania is on it. Well, it's it's not anything like the other Castlevanias. Uh, whenever people said that, do you know what I had to do? Mm -hmm. Look at the other go, Castlevanias. Well, no. The, the, the one I always get. Because whenever... I, I find that many of the purists stepped up from the Egavania games. The Egavania likes. The ones that gave us such an, an, an enormous glut of fun and lore and and helped codify the name Metroidvania for games that are like that. Um, uh, I find a lot of them, I'm like, so it's not a Castlevania game. If it's not a Castlevania game, then you must surely mean this. And I would show them Castlevania 1. Yep. <laughs> and they'd be like, no, it's not Castlevania either. I'm like, this is the very first Castlevania game, bro. This is more Castlevania than, uh, than this. And I threw <laughs> Symphony of the Night up, and I'm like, at least by your definition. I... <laughs> how much Castlevania this game is, really. Yeah. This is this is the most Castlevania. It is this right here. Authentic Castlevania. Exactly. And then you show them Symphony of the Night, which is exactly what they're thinking. Or Aria of Sorrow, or uh, any of those. And you go, see this here? This I'm sure this is actually what you're thinking about this is Castlevania. But I gotta tell you, it's not. I'm sorry, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. You'd be like, how am I wrong? I'd be like, because this is the first game that came. This is the first game with the name. This, this, is, this is Castlevania. And if we're going by your definition, that it has to be the way all the other Castlevanias have always been. Well, first of all, not all the Castlevanias have always been that way. But if we have to go back to or Originator, it's this one. So you're wrong, too. That uh, that oh. does br that does bring me to, to something that um. And J JT, I, rem I remember that you brought this up as a, as a question about what about um about whether or not whether or not Cas whether or not Castlevania can return in game form in the future. Um, person now personally, putting us putting aside the fact that Konami is bullshit, stupid. Um, who is more who is more interested in pu in pouring more in pouring more money into Duel Links than anything else? Hey, Duel Links gets them a lot of money. That's why. Mm -hmm. Anyway, guys, I'm uh, I'm a head out. I'm starting to fade over here. All right, all right, all right stay, shades. Stay frosty. Hi, right, guys. Hey, shades. But the I re but I recently saw a video from Foxcade called "How Pokemon Has Become a Logistical Nightmare." 
and <laughs> and the bi- and a big fr- and while Castlevania isn't as bad as this kind of thing because because they didn't um because they they didn't go with a gimmick that was that was going to screw them that was going to screw them over from from the get go because they didn't future proof themselves. There is the issue of what's of what style to what style to go with if they go if they were to create another game. Do they go do they go with the do they go with the level based approach of the pa of the of the early days? Do they go with the do they go with the Ega style? And if they go with the Ega style, then there's going to be the elephant in the room of <laughs> the fact that they ran out e- ran out Ega because they told him that his that his particular style wasn't go- wasn't going to sell. Which um, I I would say uh, it, to to answer the question, absolutely can Castlevania come back in game form. Absolutely, in any of those styles, and we already have an example of that. Ega's own kickstarted game, Bloodstained. Bloodstained. Mm-hmm. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which yes, but mo- but that's one half of the equation because I'd I'd say I'd say um e- I'd say Ega found the found the ideal solution to this issue in the in the fact that for for the people who want the more who want the more Egavania approach, there is Ritual of the Night. Yep. For the people who want the who want the more um who want the more uh, want the more linear level based approach. There is he did Curse that too. Of, there is Curse of the Moon. That there's he, Curse of the Moon, um, and he, Curse of the Moon too, which is just bonkers. <laughs> if you wait. if you get the right if you get the best ending. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The I do I do feel I need to point out that that um he was only responsible for say producing it. Curse of the Moon one and two were handled by Inti Creates. Yes, the, it, he he gave them the enemy. Dis- uh, names and designs of, of that you would see in the 3D game, mm-hmm. and the character names and designs that you would see in the 3D game, and a g- very general, hey, you know, maybe this is a story you can follow thing, and then just let Inti Creates go go to ha- town. And I'd like to point out that Inti Creates has made some baller 2D games. Uh, well, I mean, for for one that comes off the top of my head because it's so goddamn good, Azure Striker Gunvolt. Yes, and it, um, and it's um and it's slight spinoff um Luminous um Striker. Yes, but for for example, things that they published that I'm sure most people don't realize they published the entire Mega Man Zero series, mm-hmm. the entire Mega Man ZX series, Mega Man Nine itself. Mega Man 10, which means any of the collections of Mega Man Classics, uh, Mega Man X, and Mega Man Zero, I believe, were through them. Yeah. Um, they they made the Galgun games. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, I, I believe then, they're course, also responsible for bla- for the resurgence of Blaster Master. Uh, yes, Blaster Master Zero, um, Mighty Gunvolt Burst, which is interesting. Um, and then, of course, they've, they've got an entire Blaster Master Zero, they've got Blaster Master Zero 1 and 2, mm-hmm. and then, then they're going to be making, uh, even more versions for it for Windows and Xbox and Switch, and, uh, uh there's going to be a trilogy that eventually comes out on Windows, PlayStation 4, and Switch mm-hmm. this year, um, if it isn't already out. July 29th, so it'll be the end of this month. Mm-hmm. In Japan, at least. Um, but they also... They did the porting for games that... Or they did, they helped with um, Mighty Number no. Nope. Which, <laughs> I do not give them... I, I, I don't blame them for the bullshit on that. That's all... Concept. That's and... all concept. That's yeah. all Kenji. Especially when you consider the qu- the quality of w- the quality of what Concept did after the fact versus the quality of what Inti Creates did after the fact. Yes, and the fact that Concept did four Kickstarters that have only created one product and none of the others are out yet. Mm-hmm. Mm. We don't get into that though. No. Um, 
But Inti, Inti creates is ever since I had learned of them and looked at what they'd done, I was marvelously impressed. Mm-hmm. Um, they are a fantastic set of developers. Uh, <laughs> and they they make some very fun games. I mean, they, they, uh, and then they started self-publishing. Mm-hmm. Cause, cause the, the stuff like, you know, Mega Man, the Mega Man series is all Capcom. So, uh, or the fact that they did the, one of the Eureka seven games that goes through Namco Bandai. Cause it's a Bandai property, mm-hmm. things of that nature. But Gunvolt, Blaster Master, Gal Gun 2 is fully them. Like, Gal Gun 1 and Gal Gun Double Piece, uh, they're working with P-Cube and Alchemist there. Mm-hmm. But Gal Gun 2 is developed and published by them. Uh, and they also made a fantastic game that uh, I think anyone should play. Very little known game. Dragon marked for death. Very yes, um, especially 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 if you were any especially if you are, if you were a fan of 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 I was gonna I was gonna bring up Mistara, but Mistara got it got its own got its own successor elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, Dragon marked for death is is just a is just a damn good entry. It's a really good game, and the fact that you can play co op. Mm-hmm. Is bonkers. Well, that, that's the reason why you play these kind of co- kind of co-op games to bo- to both laugh at other people's failures and ye- and get and get yelled at for screwing something up. Or if you've power leveled your characters in solo play and you're going and helping newbies, um, getting fawned over for having a character that's at level fifty when they're level two. That sounds like a flex on your part. I was legitimately looking to help people, asshole. I didn't even say, look at my level 50 character. I just went in with Mr. Tanky Tank, because Mr. Tanky Tank is probably the best for supporting anyone. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're like, oh, th- thank you, I couldn't pass that mission. And I'm like, no problem. I remember going through this mission. It was fucked. Solo play. Yeah. So, I, uh... In case anyone... Can't tell. Dragon Mark for Death uh, has a special place in my heart for many reasons. Mm-hmm. But the 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 successors to Castlevania games that we've seen come out, not just Ega's own game with Bloodstain. There are multiple, as we've talked before, mm-hmm. styles of games called Metroidvania. And oh yeah, oh yes. There are some which I would consider, in some ways, to be a Castlevania esque. Uh, spiritual successor due to their idea of fighting uh, in in a gothic world, mm-hmm. at least with some of the Castlevania inspirations. Uh, one of my favorites that I personally consider a Castlevania-like uh, spiritual successor, Blasphemous. Yes, I mean you've got you've got the whole gothic horror going on. Uh, you've got it's 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 very Spanish with all of its nomenclature. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also very Catholic. The, the entire game is balls to the wall hard at times. Yeah, it's it's. Oh, but you've got you've got stuff like that. You have um always always legacy, which go which goes a bit more in the into the puzzle solving end of things. Um, mm-hmm. You have the you have the fan project in in the form of the Lacard Chronicles. Mm-hmm. Um, and then. And then if we if we go into other uh, a, a, a other more um, shall we say derivative works and they're not shy about showing their derivative nature mm-hmm. silver knights crusaders which you mentioned you wanted to talk about before we started yeah i wanted to i wanted to bring that up as well as well as a few others like like um min, like minoria and and miss of noia because 
due to due to the fact that we are that we are in a we are in a position where there is a sl where there is a slew of ga of games that are t that are t that are taking they're taking cues from ca from the, from bo from both ends of the spectrum when it comes to Castlevania. That means that there is a that means that there is a lot of competition in this regard. It's all um, if you'll re if you'll recall. I ended up saying something similar when when um a lot when a lot of people were tr were trying to jump on the hype wagon for um for the remastered Diablo 2 and I and I had said there's But why? Cuz because 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 brand stupidity. Um well well I mean my 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 reaction was but why and your reaction was they're stepping into a world of competition. Yeah, cuz it it's not let me let me list let me list off some names and some and several of these names have been around in the last decade. Um, mm -hmm. And it looks like we lost Akira. Path of, Path of Exile, Titan yep. Quest, which has been around for yep. long, which has been around for quite a while and re and got a resurgence. Um, yep. Warhammer Chaos Bane. Yep. Um, I'd say, I'd say and um, Grim Grim Dawn. Mm -hmm. Those are those are just four those are just four major ones and especially something like Grim Dawn which it which it which is a behemoth of an, of an entry and Path of Exile is free. <laughs> Path of Exile is not only free and I was when you when you said uh uh Grim Dawn is a behemoth I was going to say Path of Exile then would be Kaiser Behemoth because holy shit they, they they have seasons and everything in this free game, in ways that things get reset and changed, and it's just like a new game or a semi new game every season, mm -hmm. and it keeps people going. To the point it's, where they set they were they were setting up their own um, exile con. Exactly. It. I mean, when it comes to this whole uh, remake of Diablo two versus all that, Diablo two. The people who are playing Diablo 2 are playing Diablo 2 already. They're playing the old one. Or they're, not or, going... they're or they're playing a, or they're playing a heavily modded version like say Median XL or D or D2D, which is Diablo which is Diablo meets Doom. Yeah. Um and in addition, the Diablo 2 thing comes out right after their severe fuck up with uh Warcraft 3. Reforged. Don't you mean refunded? Uh, <laughs> don't don't you mean slag on the molten heap of failure? If we're gonna use forging jokes, um, Amber can't come soon enough. <laughs> my, I, well, and the big thing there, I, oh, I had already given up my my battle net and my Blizzard account by that point because of uh, Blitzchung. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Um, so it didn't matter to me. But it mattered to my friends. I told them, don't do it. Don't get it. If you have it already on your Blizzard account, download the actual DRM-free stuff that you can get mm -hmm. and keep it. And my friends are very thankful that I told them to do that because they still have their original version of, of fucking Diablo 3. Or not Diablo 3, uh, Warcraft 3. Because uh, with Reforged, it replaced the original. Mm-hmm. And so, <sighs> Blizzard's already in a bad place. Yeah. And them trying to garner appeal by remaking fan masters and then destroying the old versions. Uh, yeah, no. Even even if they don't even if they don't pull that bullshit a second time, nobody's willing to trust. Nobody's willing to take that gamble. <laughs> and um. and the reason we're expanding upon all this is because if Castlevania is to Return the actual named Castlevania, not some of these others that are spiritual successors or inspired by or good games within the same vein of Castlevania type games. Um, you've got three things going against it. One, Konami. The name Konami alone is shit. It is. It is tainted. It, it, Toxic. Well, it's. It's like any pump and dump um, cryptocurrency. 
it's a bad name supported by some people who get paid lots of money to support it. Because if they can get a few suckers on the hook, they can get their payoff real quick and then dump them. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, you've got the fact that many of the names that would have been behind games from Konami, not just Castlevania, but you know, Kojima went off, made his own studios, partnered with Sony. Uh, Igarashi has his own studio now because of the Kickstarter for Bloodstained. Um, you, you've got these powerhouses that they kept in their pockets now out in the world doing their own thing. So that's that's number two. And number three is the move they already made towards games nobody wants that have these names. The mobile games and pachinko games. Incidentally, when it came when it came to their attempt at a mobile game, I thought it was I thought it was pants on the head stupid that Two. that they um well I want to specifically focus on Castlevania Mobile because for whatever reason when they put that thing in in beta, they only put the thing in beta in the U.S. and Canada. They have they have three mobile games, Monk. Yeah, I'm specifically referring to um the to the last one. The, the most the most recent one, Grimoire of Souls. Yeah, yeah. Which, and of course, of course, of course, for me personally, you already, you already know that I'm not that I'm not I'm not dealing I'm not dealing with I'm not dealing with any mobile games because I'm I still I still have a degree of I still have a degree of resentment for the fact that the one t the one time that that a, that a mobile game seemed to be getting it right has been ripped from me. And I have ne Which and I will never forgive the platform since. Which game was that? Infinity Blade. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. That was uh. that was the tr that Infinity Blade is because because of because of the current unless you have unless you have an outdated version of Ma of Mac OS on on your um on your system, you can you cannot play it. Um. Yeah. Or you could, you know, emulate an iOS on your computer and do that. But that's that's a whole different set of hoops. But the, that's the fact that the name is toxic is is one is one is one obstacle. Um, I get the second obstacle is the is the fact that people are going to com are going to compare it to at the very least Bloodstained. Possibly, yeah. At the at the most. The glut, the glut of the glut of Metroidvania likes that have come that have come out in the last six years. Well, and that's only for people looking at the Metroidvania titles because that's what they are expecting from the next Castlevania. If it's all gamers that we're thinking of, this is going to be compared to every every game that has been made in a Castlevania uh, style, like you said, all sides of the, all all points on the spectrum from what we saw in Castlevania 1 all the way to what we saw in Lords of Shadow that, that keep the same sorts of elements intact. They're going to be looked at, and they're going to be... It, it's going to be found to be... I almost guarantee that Konami would play it safe. They wouldn't try to go too big with the experimentation. They wouldn't try to go uh, too big with uh, differences in characters and story and anything of that nature mm -hmm. um they would they would probably play a metroidvania because those were the most popular titles bar none um they would probably make a metroidvania starring a belmont because they want to return to belmonts and it would probably even be a metroidvania somewhere in medieval or victorian era mm -hmm. because those are the gothic tones they'd want to go for well, and then they get curveballed with that, though. Are they going to consider the success of the Netflix series here, or are they going to just like be like, ah, uh, whatever? I don't think Konami will consider the success of the Netflix series for video. games. I don't games. think so either. <laughs> no, not not for video games because uh, Konami is going to consider it an entirely different medium, an entirely different uh, an entirely different audience that just happens to have an overlap with Castlevania game fans. Mm -hmm. Um. Konami's never been particularly bright about overlapping fandoms, um, as evidenced by their 
terrible handling of Metal Gear Solid in the Metal Gear series after. Solid, uh, Silent Hills Konami, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I yeah. mean, like, anytime they cross media, they never, like, they never cross-pollinate for some reason, and they, they've screwed up, I want to say, I want to say all of them. I want to say every time that yes. Konami's ever, ever done this, they've always fucked it up somehow. Yes. That's why I'm saying they won't consider it. They're, they are, unless they were to suddenly get an influx of people into their upper management into onto their board that have an insight into how the fandoms actually work mm -hmm. they will never be able to revive anything with any sense of permanence and they might be able to generate know. yeah i don't even know if it's because i think you're right i think the fact that all the talent moved on and made their own studios i think it might just be past the point where you can revive castlevania in any meaningful way I think you, again, if you had somebody who had the notion of, well, the fans are overlapped between these two, and there's this there's this hankering in the, in the fandom for a return to maybe old Castlevania form. Maybe we need to go with the linear style again. Or maybe we need to make a 3D game uh, that doesn't have a clunky map like Lament of Innocence did, but is, you know, even better. Maybe... If you can find someone who's willing to present the risks as rewards and present them very handily as rewards because they have data from the fandoms, you might be able to see them get off their asses, kowtow in front of X talent and be like, we want to contract your development studio to help us with a Castlevania revival. You'll never see Konami do that without some new some new blood in the leadership. You will never see them do that. They have. I know. I know that some people will bring up the fact that they are they are they are in in talks with the developers of the recent game, The Medium, which I haven't played, but it but it look but um I might delve into I might delve into it down the line, um for a few for a future Silent Hill project. The um, the reason the reason why I'm not putting any stock into that is for one. I have my policy of trailer or get the fuck out. Two, I in the past two years, I have heard about no less than six proposed Silent Hill projects that went nowhere. Well, I have a bit, little bit more optics into this, um, Monk. Um, what it is, is first there was the abandoned trailer on during E3 that was uh, thought to be a stinger from Kojima to create a Silent Hills game. Um, but it wasn't. The The actual developer for Abandon actually exists and is not a, a is not Joaquim, like last time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, uh, and other things like that. There, there's been a lot of um, vetting process to show that the developer of Abandon actually exists. But uh, we do have confirmation from bl both Blooper Studios, the guys who made the Medium and, and some other games such as Layers of Fear, um, and Konami. They did confirm that they are getting into some sort of partnership, but no details have been discussed. At least not publicly. Um, so Blooper Studio and Konami are getting into a, what was it called, a strategic a strategic actionable partnership so it's not like one's contracted to the other this is both on equal footing um mm -hmm. and people are going oh god the, the they make they make good horror games silent hill silent hill and i'm sitting here going guys calm your tits it could be silent hill and then it couldn't it could be something entirely different. That's that's why that's why I'm not that's why I'm not jumping on that on that whole thing. Yeah, um, the only I, thing we know is that it's going to be a horror. It's going to be a horror property because that's what Blooper does. Yeah. The I'd say I'd say one I'd say one one other um at one avenue that ne that I find I find kind of amusing is when you, when you look at when you look at a lot of the strong IPs that that konami ha that konami has a lot of the a lot of them um are be are being handled um somewhere else for example Co um we already have a spiritual successor with contra in the form of blazing chrome 
Now they yep. tried bringing back Contro with um, with with in t in t with two attempts over the past couple generations. There was Hardcore Uprising, which was a weird mix of Contra and Guilty Gear because they brought in Daisuke Ishiwatari to work on that. Hey, anything with uh with Daisuke Ishiwatari is automatically better than it what it would have been otherwise. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> And then there was Rogue Core, which was shit. And for and further um and further hammers home the point. Contra should not go 3D. It, not in not in terms of, in terms of gameplay style. If you want to go 3D in terms of graphics, that's perfectly fine. Shattered Soldier did that, and that was good. Mm hmm But. And when it, when it comes to Suikoden, well, we already know we've already talked about that story elsewhere. Still Indeed. looking for, still looking forward to that. Um, when it when it comes to and when it comes to Castlevania, we're see, we're seeing that with Bloodstained and a multitude of of other projects. Um, well, and uh, and uh, with with Bloodstained, it's a double whammy. I mean, like, like, like we pointed out, there have been tons of really good Metroidvania type, Egovania type games. Mm -hmm. But when you've got an Egovania made by fucking Ega and uh, scored by Michiru <laughs> Yamane and a bunch of other, and you've got voices returning like Robbie Belgrade, and you even got a uh, um, Ega casting <laughs> David Hayter. Uh, really, Solid Snake himself is going to be in this one. It, 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 well, he was in Bloodstained. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure he was on. Uh, what was he in Bloodstained? I can't really recognize his voice. I love that guy. Pretty sure it was on Getz. Yep, yeah, I think it was, it was on, on Getz. Yeah, that it was rules. on. It was on Getz, and I, I know, I would know because of the repeat amount of times he kept kicking my ass. Ah, uh, Zon Getz, <sighs> such a good fight. Like originally, uh, David Hayter said that he was probably going to be Jeebel, but uh. Then Ego is like, nah, let's do you as Zangets. You're gonna be this vengeful bounty, uh, vengeful demon hunter. And uh, and David was like, yeah, I'm cool with that. <laughs> um, also, also right there. for for a uh, for a very old meme, friendship ended with Kojima. I'm now best friends with Ega. Thank you, David <laughs> Hater. <laughs> Thank you, David Hater. <laughs> I uh. I, uh, like, you've got this, this entire game was a series of fucking knockout punches. It's like, and, it's, and it, it's, the best part, Ego wasn't even trying to compete with anybody. He just wanted to create something that was stuck in his head. He needed to get it out. That's how he expressed it in all of the developer diaries on the, on the YouTube channel. That's how he expressed it in the Kickstarter video. He just had something he had to make, and he needed our help. Mm -hmm. I backed that Kickstarter your... day of. You sound so fucking amazing. Like you're just <laughs> this incredible geek energy flowing out of you like a fire hydrant right now. I'm loving <laughs> to hear this. Bruh, no, you, you don't understand. Well, you probably do understand actually. But like the 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 thing is, I saw this pop up in the first hour it popped up on Kickstarter, mm -hmm. and I was like, Ega making another Metroidvania. Make, calling it an Egovania because it should but rightfully be called an Egovania. Um, and and he's sure, like Robbie Belgrade and David Hayter and a whole bunch of other people that I really love and Michiru Yamane. I just looked at the Kickstarter page and my brain broke and 30 seconds later all I knew was you've, you've backed at this level. I'm like it's a drug. <laughs> it's a drug! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I am I am supremely glad that I kickstarted, um, yeah. especially because with Iga, Iga, you could do a comparison between all the things Comcept did wrong that Iga and his studio completely avoided the pitfalls of. Um, for example, when things like backtracking and having to restart happened, mm -hmm. came out on the YouTube channel every time he's like hey look we've been having a lot of problems with this engine things just aren't working here we have to switch engines we're switching to this engine and now we have to start from the beginning it's going to cause a further delay and we're really sorry about that 
Um, it, it actually went to the point where he could no longer do the Wii U release, which was uh, sad for a lot of people, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Um, sad for all two of them. All two of them. <laughs> Um, but he did change that over to a Nintendo Switch release, and he offered refunds to people who, if they weren't going to get a Wii U release, mm-hmm. could get a refund. And they did. He did everything right. Full transparency, constant developer diaries. He took... I remember the day he put out, like, when it was getting close to going gold, like a few months out, mm-hmm. uh, the day he put out a video where... Um, He's like, you guys have had a lot to say about the art direction. And it was just tons of, like, Steam reviews on the demos and all this stuff saying, the art is shit. You know, this is all really bad. It looks really gross. Gameplay looks fantastic. But, you know, and so he's like, okay, yeah, we heard you guys. And we understand. And then he just does this side-by-side comparison of how they changed the art assets. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, Iga, Iga, you give so much and and then so much more. Thank you. I think we, t- uh, that that was a hard flex on his part, man. Oh, that was a huge. Oh, flex. That was a huge flex. <laughs> He's like, "Fuck it, I take I take criticism. You guys didn't like the art. Fine, we'll we'll make it better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll make it better with blackjack and hookers. I mean, those are both in the game, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the the bunny girls. Yeah. <laughs> India. Let's let's not, let's. Not. But the the um. But it's for, it's for now. Those are those are two. It's because it's because of those kind of things and the fact that um, any any Castlevania project that they have, they're going to they're going to have to, addr- they're going to have to address that level of transparency. And if they can't have that level of transparency, their the comparison is going to be inevitable. They're gonna be. Everybody's gonna be like, "Why don't you show us the development process, Konami?" Konami's gonna be like, "Uh, trade secrets. Uh, corporate espionage. Uh, but you did it. it. I mean, like, they're just too big to even give a shit, though. I I know. Like a corporation like that, they don't care about what indies like us do. They they Mm -hmm. don't give a shit. It's like it's like assuming that Hasbro would give a shit about my game. They don't. I'm not a dot on their radar. Like even if people even people that are in the industry like start drawing lines of comparison. The Hasbro execs aren't going to sneeze at it. The the Watsi execs aren't going to sneeze at it. They just don't care. They're not going to go Darren's parent just because someone is actually able to do it better. Eh, doesn't matter. They're I just know, too big to I fail. Know Mer- it's, I know, it's frustrating, but it's true. I know Merle's and Crawford try try and cl- try and claim transparency, but that's a whole other matter. Um, oh my God! Don't don't get me started on those assholes. That that can be another geek watch. I'll, I'll <laughs> those assholes. Um, but, we have always promised a Watt C Geek Watch sometime sometime down the road, haven't we, Monk? Yeah, I, f- I feel like I feel like the perfect opportunity to do that is is when we fit is when we finish with the le- with the um with the level, level up eval, project. Yeah, which the capstone for that is going is going to be going over it when the full book releases. I'm put I'm putting yeah. that out there. Um, but oh, but overall, if there if there's any if there's any takeaway. It's the takeaway that I, that I've all, that I've always that I've always had with this with this kind of thing, which is if you are lamenting that there are no that there are no that there's no um ca- that there's no Castlevania games on the horizon, you are making excuses at this juncture because that because there there was there's a lot more there's a lot more that I could that I could have gone over that I didn't. There's there's a lot of people doing in, doing interesting spins on the formula that Co- that Konami I, even in their prime wouldn't be able to do. Iconoclasts. That's another game you didn't mention that I can just thought of on the top of my head now. Um, I'd also br- I'd also bring up um, Three Thousandth Duel as <laughs> as a met as a Metroidvania with a little bit of Tim Burton thrown in. <laughs> the I guess the ultimate then, the ultimate answer to the question, can a Castlevania game ever come out again, is it's already been done. Every type of Castlevania game that's come out has been remade in some way, shape, or form. I prefer The Last Faith myself. (laughs) That's a good one, too. It's, It's basically... Just because the name Castlevania is not printed there on the box doesn't mean that it doesn't have the soul and heart 
of Castlevania built into it. There are, you are numerous a, games out there that you have are it. After my own heart. I, I love that. I, I love that roll up your sleeves and make your own Castlevania attitude. Hell yeah. Plus, Why the this, fuck this, this not? Is... How this many dude has all the passion and vo and, and speech eloquence of like a Sunday morning preacher. I mean, I feel like I'm yeah. I feel I feel in, I, I feel inspired by this man's words. <laughs> I'm converted. But, <laughs> but the, 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 I guess I guess to in comparison to the monk, I'm I'm the I'm the um I'm the ecclesiarch. I'm the man ecclesiarch DC is the twenty fourth. <laughs> <laughs> For that reference. <laughs> but. The f the funny thing is how how often ha how often have we heard the line of well if you're gonna complain so much why don't you make why don't you make your own anybody oh, who sure. anybody who's nope. making that com anybody who's making that line nowadays has no room to talk because people called that bluff yeah exactly people called the bluff and every time someone goes oh there's no X or oh there's no Y we can still say don't like it make your own. Make your own. Take your passion. Take your ideals. Make your own. Otherwise, you are not. Otherwise, you're just a um, dog sitting on a nail. And I, I, I wasted my money sending it to Tony Robbins. I should have just stayed here with you and listened to Z and listen to Zan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that I can impassion others with my own. Well, and even if you're not making your own, someone's kickstarting it. Like exactly. someone is doing it, give them money. You'll get more of what you the love. Support, yeah, the support. There's the other one. Vote with your fucking wallet. Yep. That's the other part of this uh, part of this equation. You don't think you have the skill to make a game or the knowledge? There's two. There's two paths there. Look for someone who's making what you like. Support them, or go find the skills. They're all over the net. This episode was brought to you by Skillshare. <laughs> No, fuck you and fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have I don't have near I don't have nearly the level of pull that that I that I that I would to to do an to um do a sponsored read. And truth be told, if I was to do a, if I was to do a sponsored read, I would pro I would prob I would only do that solely so I can take the piss out of Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> no, somebody, somebody's way ahead of you there. Um, Flash gets got a Raid Shadow Legends sponsor on his animation about special education in Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah, I, fi I figured, I figured somebody mm -hmm. would, I figured somebody would have beaten me to the punch on that. That was released this year in April. <laughs> Raid Shadow Legends, basically. <laughs> Like this is if you've ever watched the animation, it's can it's it's full of things that would put Flash Kids through cancel culture if he hadn't already been through it like seven times and doesn't give a shit. <laughs> um, and and uh, Raid Shadow Legends <laughs> sponsored that. I think so. The, I th but so, also, also, there's the fact that um the ki the king of parodying it was um was Sid Alpha with Raid Shadow Wallet. The Ridge is a good wallet. I'll, I'll yeah. get in that. Um, but, but with but with all that said, getting back on rails, I think I think we covered that there, even even with the lengthy um legacy legacy, the name the name is the name is still going to be drawn upon for a lot for a lot of people for for quite a, for quite a while as with um t with time. And I'm not I'm not saying that the that um that we're not going to be seeing any any Castlevania any Castlevania games it's just that there's going to be a mountain to climb and you're, mm -hmm. I do I do have a I do have a strong feeling that even even with the bit of drama that happened with Warren Ellis this month um he's not he's not gone from the project um cuz I look I looked at that particular thing and it was just a bunch of it was just a bunch of um I think I think just some guy put it best when he said it's a bunch of hoes who realize that they're hoes yeah, oh. and and ultimately, um, if for whatever reason Konami does decide to do a Castlevania in whatever style, I mean, hell, could you imagine if they just went full like open world action RPG? That'd be that'd be a pretty baller Castlevania, actually. 
Um, could, could work. Could work. Uh, but it, it's essentially no matter no matter how they did it, Konami has three basic things that will need to be uh, addressed. Very basic. One, it has to be at a quality that you would expect from a AAA game. It can't be, oh, we're saying it's a AAA game, but really it's just, you know, a single-A game coming from a AAA developer. It's going to have to be at that high level of scrutiny. So they're actually going to have to put money behind it, which they don't like doing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. That's the first basic assumption. The second is that they're they're going to need to give um, whoever has creative control of whatever this project will be, because they're probably not going to do it in-house, let's be perfectly fair there. They're going to need to give I mean, those people... their talent. There's no way they can do it in-house. Yeah, exactly. Um, they're going to have to give whoever they, they contract, employ, or otherwise... Uh, put to the task of making this next Castlevania game. Basically un unfettered, or as the, the, the least amount of fetters as possible when it comes to creative control. These people need to take what is Castlevania, distill it, mold it, change it, morph it into something fun to play, fun to watch, fun to hear, while still keeping the, the essence of Castlevania. They can't do it with a rope formula. This is going to have yeah, right. to... Th that's tough, too. It's hard to distill the essence of something, make it recognizably a game, and still have that same kind of creative, visionary energy that you're talking about. But they would have to do both. They, they would. Uh, it, again, if, if this Castlevania game is going to overcome uh, e the fact that Iga came back out of the woodwork with his own game, the fact that there's a glut of games of every type that are recognizable as Castlevania likes out in the world there they have to it has to be high quality where it has to be able to take risks and most of all uh it has to be um multi-platform mm -hmm. they can't do an exclusive it has to be on uh mm -hmm. probably the three the three most likely are going to be the xbox series the playstation 5 and pc uh, they likely will not appeal to Nintendo Switch. Uh, as much as I love the Switch, I love it dearly. There's fantastic games and it's fantastic hardware. Because of its status as a hybrid um, mobile and, or well, handheld and console uh, gaming experience, it is unfortunately un underpowered as far as hardware goes. And this is going to be it, it, this hypothetical Castlevania coming from Konami Publishing and a separate developer is going to be something frankly outside of its it, its area of expertise so you know actually like looking at this from a business perspective i wonder if the genie is out of the bottle when it comes to like the metroidvania formula like the thing that made symphony in the night such a like magic bullet in terms of its unique appeal like you said People know how to design that way. Like, there's full-on YouTube breakdowns of how these worked, why they worked, and how you can replicate it. I don't know. I, wandering, like, trying to wade into the competition from the indie scene, and especially how much, like, the new uh, Nintendo system is supporting indie developers. If I were oh, God, me, I probably just wouldn't. I, I, like, I wouldn't even, like, try to give someone money and claim that it was a Castlevania. I, I just straight up wouldn't. Like, if you're not willing to put enough money to woo back your talent and even then like you're still effectively competing against your own creation that's escaped your clutches because it's not like they ever copyrighted the metroidvania formula uh, they know, couldn't man. you, you yeah, couldn't I, do I, that I, it's, it would be too complicated right and they didn't they didn't keep the talent that could make it at a higher caliber than everybody else and pay them so they they kind of fucked up twice there i honestly don't know if we're going to see more castlevania not not of the quality you're describing at least well, and that's why I said full creative control and not necessarily beholden to all of the Castlevania formulas we've seen in the past. Like I said, they may be able to take the Castlevania, the soul, the essence of what is Castlevania, distill it down into a full-on open-world action RPG a la um, Final Fantasy VII Remake or something along those lines, and 
run with it. And it may be glorious and magnificent with whoever they work with to do it. You never know until it happens, but I don't think it ever will. Simply not because of the fact that they that, that it would be competing against their creation that is now running amok without them, but because of the fact that it's money. They're greedy, grubbing bastards. They don't want to pay money for anything. I mean, like... You take a risk if you think it's going to be a big return, right? But the thing is, at that point, because you're talking about bringing in an auteur creator to revitalize the franchise with something new and unique, why would you shackle that to a pre-existing franchise that you're going to divide the fan base over? You, the best move for that, the best investment, is letting him do his own thing giving him the resources to do it. That's what you would do. Yeah. I think that you're describing circumstances where it really is like economically infeasible to make the kind of Castlevania that would actually be competitive anymore. It might actually be past the time. That's And that may very well be the case. Time will be the only answer to that. But those are the... In the hypothetical situation that Konami wants to make a new Castlevania, and it's going to be successful, those are the factors that have to be hit. Those are the factors that they have to, that they have to meet and possibly exceed in, and that's a lot of very high-level factors to be near perfect on yeah no I, I honestly i think what i would do is i would find i would probably grab some low-cost indie developers and like i'd aim for the biggest market which is probably mobile and do another kind of aria of sorrow like and just kind of aim for that uh much lower cost much lower expectations because you know probably the, about the triple a like main console release kind of thing you've got an inbuilt audience that will basically consume whatever you make if you put the right art on the box that's probably the next Castlevania we're going to see if we ever see one. Mm. That is an exchange go machine. Um, well, you're actually mostly right there. We actually... Uh, there's a, a Castlevania that came out in 2019 on mobile. That was Castlevania Grimoire of Souls. Mm -hmm. There's a Castlevania to be announced coming out on mobile called Castlevania Moonlight Rhapsody. Yeah, mark my fucking words. If you look at who's designing that game, who's helming it, it's some hungry indie who designed something like that before. No, it's uh, it's worse than that. Oh, really? It's Chinese. Ooh. Sh and Shung into the trash it goes. Xiongqiu uh, Games. Uh, who... Man, way to fucking outsource. Ugh. They published and operated games including Aeon, Maple Story, Ragnarok Online, DDO. Oh, shit. Yeah. The Maple Story people did this? Oh, and, well, no. The, the Maple Story people who, who published and operated the games in China. Specifically. Oh, okay. These are the publishers. Mm -hmm. so, Ragnarok, Ragnarok and Maple are Korean in, by design, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Whereas. The 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 Shangchu games only only published those games, whereas these guys yeah. uh, designed are designing the next Castlevania game, not just yeah, publishing but, it. But think about Maple Story. That's like the, like that, that's the one that sticks out in my mind as like the perfect Skinner box game of delayed gratification and consistent button mashing, like. Mm -hmm. That's what we're gonna see, and like the, the really, and and we're going back to Ego Raptor here with my my criticism of the Aria of Sorrow esques, where there's a whole lot of like fancy hit sparks and good feelings, but there's no real challenge underlying a lot of those games because you can just grind and then come back and kill X boss and so many hits. There's no real actual obstacles in them. There's no satisfaction. They're just junk food video games and. It sounds like Konami understands this, and that's the market they're teetering towards because those people have money. Ooh, oh no. Yep. Oh, 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 oh no! What is this? It it looks like it's trying to be a from the assets that we've seen released on stuff, like it's trying to be a mobile version of one of the metroidvanias and a vn at the same time oh dear and it, the the plot synopsis translated in the middle of, and late 19th century nearly 100 years have passed since alucard and richter belmont defeated dracula and destroyed castlevania what <clears throat> during this period dracula was summoned to resurrect several times but mankind has prevailed over and over again Meanwhile, the Belmont has disappeared for a long time, and the Morris family who replaced them in charge of the Holy Whip has not yet fully mastered the method of liberating the Holy Whip. 
In order to stop the monster riots and prevent the resuscitation of Castlevania, mankind has established many organizations to explore ways to fight against the dark with magic and technology. In 1870, Castlevania appeared again. The major organizations began to gather hunters into Castlevania to regain safety and order for mankind. The story has just begun. Oh, no. <clears throat> it's an... A like, the art's okay. I think some of this art's just straight up ripped from older older uh, Konami art, though. In fealty oh, to the God Emperor, our undying lord, I declare exterminatus. Sanction, sanction extremists are authorized, Inquisitor. You have, you have the go ahead. Yes, when it comes to this kind of thing, I am, I am, per, I am, per, I am perfectly willing and able to drop virus bombs on the on this premise. And it's only for Chinese markets, apparently. Well, at what the very the... least, we won't have to deal with it. What in the fuck? I don't... Mm. Mm. Apparently it's actually good, according to MMO culture. Tech Raptors just like, yeah, this is a thing being made. Um, I'm, not I'm not willing to fully trust MMO culture. I know, and uh, that's why I also mentioned Tech Raptor. Yeah, and... I um I've had my disagreements with Tech Raptor, but that's a whole, that's a whole other uh, story. But oh, and, and so what what Tech Raptor concludes? Shangchu Game is the same company that published Fallout Shelter Online. This game was an exclusive release to China at first, but eventually made its way to the West. Considering the wild popularity of Castlevania, especially with the continuing Netflix series, we may well get to play this new Castlevania game sometime in 2021 or 2022, because it was actually released last year, or it was shown last year mm -hmm. um so so joel your assessment while correct was wildly optimistic because <laughs> oh, <drat>. <laughs> that's a the the reality is a uh, is is lesser i mean like they're clearly price conscious when it comes to acquiring talent and just looking to, to turn over the, the grossest profit they can, which is really tragic. Like, I miss when game companies were mostly staffed and held by people who were passionate about the creative work of the game and not, like, gormless corporate executives who were just interested in the bottom line. That's really frustrating. Mm -hmm. But... Yes. E but even even so... Oh. Like I said, there will there will always be especially these days there will always be a successor if one is will is what if one is willing to look, and given how, and given the access of information as I've mentioned plenty of times over the years, there is no excuse not to look. Any Ultimately, mm -hmm. that's true. In the end, uh, one last reiteration to all you out there: it doesn't it, this doesn't even extend to Castlevania. If you have a passion about an idea about a game you want to make based on something you loved, you have the paths open to you to either learn the skills to do it yourself or employ others, support others that can do it instead. That, that is true uh, consumer freedom here. And it's everywhere online these days. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, here, here. And with with all that said, I think I think we'll I think that'll be a, that'll be a good capstone to clo to close off on this episode of Geek uh, Watch. That's a good cap. That's a good cap. And right there. next next week, we'll be taking the piss onto somebody. And of course, <laughs> and of course, some, um, and of course, some. Um, given given the date, given the day that it that it is, happy 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 Fourth of July to my, to my to my fellow Amera brats and um. And I hope I hope you I hope you had plenty I hope you had plenty of fireworks and got plenty and got plenty of drunk, but for but for me here in the temple the work continues. So until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch.